Testing, testing. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Hopefully the mic is working perfectly. Please give me a thumbs up as usual. Let me know that the mic is working perfectly. Okay, guys, today's episode, we're talking about UFC 299. I can't just do the main event. The whole card was incredible. What a lineup of fights. Guys, please give me that thumbs up. Make sure that I'm, you guys are hearing me all loud and clear, please. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. CJ. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Okay, guys, I'm going to get into it right away. First fight on the card, on the main card, was Bantamweight fight between Peter Yan and Song Yadong. What a fight. I'm not going to go play by play because it would take too long. But what a barn burner fight. What a barn burner. I had Young ahead and Peter Young picked it up. It was a seesaw battle, but I had Young a little bit ahead at, the, at first. And then Peter Young kept taking it with the takedowns control and takedowns. He did an incredible fight. I, if I if Peter Yan was fighting Sean O'Malley tomorrow, I'll pick Peter Yan. That's how impressed with I was with his performance, and I was also very impressed with also Mr. Song Yadong. Incredible fight, welterweight fight between Gilbert Burns and Jack Della Madalena. Madalena, guys, forgive me for not pronouncing it perfectly. My uh, accent is not perfect here, but. Madalena, what a performance. I had Gilbert Burns winning. There was about a minute and a half left in the fight. Madalena somersaults to an escape, gets up to his feet, lands a knee. For those of you who didn't see it, it was an incredible performance by Gilbert Burns. Madalena was in it the whole time. He was coming back often, but getting taken down way too much. I think he got taken down five times. I lost count after four or five. That was about four or five takedowns. And all of a sudden, he gets back to his feet, throws a knee, Drops Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns, in my opinion, was ahead two rounds easily. Winning round three as well. He was on top of Madalena. Madalena somersaults out. Hail Mary knee. Throws a knee. Catches Gilbert Burns shooting in. What a fight. Then after that, we had Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland versus Michael Page. Going into the third round, I had it 1-1 apiece. Not the most exciting fight. Uh, I think Michael Venom Page, sometimes he's incredibly entertaining, but sometimes the fight just, it's not going to be always exciting. You know, he's had fights like that as well. And um, it was a close, close fight. Unanimous decision for Michael Page. However, um, it was close. Holland had him down in the third round. He could have won that fight. He got him down to the ground, which makes me think, what would happen if, if Michael Venom Page fought a Kamzat? You know, what would happen if Kamzat goes to 170? What if he fought a Kumar Usman? I don't think it would go well for MVP. You know, MVP was champion in Bellator. He's fought some good wrestlers in Bellator and lost. What would he look like against a top five in UFC? I think those answers are going to be, those questions are going to be answered shortly. He fought, I think, um, Kevin is number 14 or 15, maybe 13 in the welterweight division. How is MVP going to look in the top five if he fights a top five fighter? Now, it just tells you, like, what's the level difference between UFC and Bellator? What's the level difference? You know, we saw Bellator go against PFL. Bellator kind of swept the whole night. And now you have a Bellator, ex-Bellator champion fighting somebody in the top 15, in the lower-ranked top 15, and a very seesaw battle, very close battle. Makes you think how high the level of the top five in UFC is. It's uh, quite incredible. After that, we had Dustin Poirier versus Saint-Denis. Benoit Saint-Denis. Benoit Saint-Denis immediately going for the takedown. I think it was 30 seconds. Scores a takedown. Dustin going for guillotine after guillotine. I counted four guillotines. Three where he put his back on the floor. So maybe actually he grabbed the neck five times. But three, he really jumped on his back and tried to finish. He missed every guillotine. But he fatigued Saint-Denis. For those of you who didn't see it, halfway through the fight, Dustin lands, I think it was a right hook catches St. Denis right on the chin. He didn't have to throw much. The the two, three shots he landed really hurt St. Denis, and then he put him away with a cross. Most of the fight was just St. Denis taking him down, holding him down, getting out of guillotine, and then Dustin started to get to work with the hands. Lands a beautiful combination. I can't believe Dustin Poirier was the underdog for this fight. I remember my students on Saturday morning after training, they were telling me, no, Dustin Poirier is the underdog. I was picking Dustin. I'm like, Dustin's going to win. I don't know how he's going to win, but he's, he's going to end up putting it on Benoit. And my students were like, well, he's a heavy underdog. I, I couldn't believe it. Dustin's going to be hard to hold down, hard to put away, hard to submit, hard to knock out. He has five-round experience. He can take the pressure from St. Denis. 
and um, he had a stunning knockout of Saint Denis. And then after that, it was Vera versus Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley, I think, won all five rounds. It was at least four. You know, I gotta, I gotta say, it was kind of like when we saw Chito fight. Um, who was it that we, he fought? Hold on a second. It's like when Cheeto fought. I'm forgetting his name now for a second here. Corey Sanhagen, of course. It was kind of similar. You know, he couldn't breach the distance. He couldn't get his combinations going. His corner was egging him on. Land, like, I want twos and threes. I want you to throw combinations. He couldn't get his combinations off. And the story of the night was that knee. That knee to the face to cut Cheeto open. He just seemed deflated after that knee and just couldn't get anything going. Sean O'Malley, in my opinion, uh, had a stellar performance. Fantastic. I thought he won all five rounds. But now I think it's Marab's time. If Marab fights Sean O'Malley, guys, I'm picking Marab. If Peter Yan fights Sean O'Malley somehow, some way, which I don't think is going to happen, I will pick Peter Yan. I think Sean O'Malley had a great performance, but Marab is a different animal, a very different animal. Benoit St. Denis' striking defense is poor. That's from MMA Jackal. Well, you know what? He was very aggressive. He came out wrestling. Uh, you know, he's getting successful takedowns. Kind of poor. He kind of yielded to the takedowns, threw up a guillotine. I don't know if you guys noticed, but the head kept slipping out. He made the same mistake he did with Khabib. Like, he's not controlling the head exactly correctly. You know, there's ways to avoid the head from slipping out. Make sure to check out my video, A Guillotine Made Easy. I explained the whole thing. I mean, somebody give a copy to <laughs> Poirier, please. Like, he's always letting the head slip out. It's not a complicated thing to to adjust, but he was making that same mistake in Abu Dhabi against Khabib. It's pretty pretty wild. Guys, quick note. I, I just released a man's guide to throwing a punch 2.0. For those of you who bought it before, you got the update. I've updated, I should say. Now it's a man's guide to throwing a punch 2.0. I added an hour of how to work the bag, okay? What exact combinations to throw on the bag, exact combinations. I demonstrate them, and it's an extra, it's over an hour extra footage of footage. Check out a man's guide to throwing a punch. If you bought it, all you got to do is log in, go watch the video, check out the timestamp. It's all there, it's all detailed, and make sure to use your promo code level up 50 off. Make sure to use your promo code it's on the bottom of your screen guys don't forget to punch in the promo code if you forget to punch in the promo code there's no turning back okay so make sure you punch in that promo code it's on the bottom of your screen it's on the website i don't know how you guys can get it wrong make sure to punch in that promo code and get anything you want off juji club 50 percent off okay um like i was saying what was i saying oh yes he let the head slip a few times that's something i think he's really got to correct if he corrects it it could have been a first round finish first round finish with the guillotine it was in tight the neck was bent the head was in the correct position for him to get subbed. It was slippery. The the head popped out. I don't think it have to be that. I don't think it had to be that way. Do you think three years of boxing will help you in MMA? Uh, I'm not sure who you're referring to, but I'm sure Benoît Saint Denis has a lot more years than that in, in in boxing. Okay, guys, make sure we're only talking about the fights. It's super important because if you send me uh, messages that are have nothing to do with the fight, I won't be answering them just yet. We're talking about UFC 299. I'm doing super chats and non-super chats. Salam coach Ramadan Karim. Also, yes, Ramadan Karim to you all out there. Hope you had a blessed month. Do you think Gilbert made a mistake when he was trying to change his position? I believe it was that that gave Jack the room to escape. That's from Munir Ahmad. You're 100% right. Gilbert had a one-on-one. -on -one. He had trapped Madalena's wrist and he kind of jumped forward. He kind of jerked forward. He didn't have to do that. You know, when you're, you know, Training with um, Braulio Estima, one of the top, top black belts in history. Like, he's, he's Abu Dhabi world champion, a phenom. He used to tell me, he used to tell me this, uh, you know, he, he used to talk a lot about concepts. He's a great trainer. He's a great teacher. For those of you who live in England, try to go and visit his academy. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal jiu-jitsu coach. Phenomenal. Phenomenal athlete. Phenomenal, phenomenal um, uh performer like he he can compete in the highest you know the highest stakes and the highest pressure and he does incredible but he's also a great teacher and he used to teach us concepts all the time you know he used to tell us like when you swing from one vine to the next you never let go of the first vine until you get to the second vine you know make sure you have that second vine in your hand and then you release the first vine he goes some grapplers they swing from one vine they release both hands to grab the the second vine they want to swing from one vine to the next and 
He says, when I swing from one vine to the next, when I go from one position to the other, he's saying, I never let go of the first one until I make sure I have the second one in my hand and then I'll release. It's kind of like climbing a ladder. You know, you climb a ladder. Do you skip steps or you climb one step at a time? Gilbert kind of like rushed. He kind of like, if you watch that, that scramble, and it can happen to anybody, okay, but he kind of like wanted to jerk. He wanted to pull the arm out from underneath Madalena and kind of drive forward. He had to be more methodical, more heavy, more, he had to move more slowly. He had to go from one grip to the other. Instead, he kind of junk. He kind of, he kind of, he, he kind of exploded. Well, he didn't have to. He was on top. His weight was on top. And you're right. It gave Madalena the momentum to roll out. Absolutely, 100% agree with you. And if not, it, he, <laughs> it was about a minute and a half left. I mean, Gibber would have just, you know, broken back down to the mat, did a little ground and pound, would have won the fight. <clears throat> okay, what else we got here? Coach, fighters who start very late but have great genes seem to close the gap in training fast. What is the relationship between great genes and very late starters? What make what it what makes it to UFC examples? That's from Aris God. Um nine, uh listen, genetics are definitely a factor. So that's talent. We don't say genetics, we say talent. That person's talented. Maybe that person is very explosive, or maybe that person has a natural endurance, or maybe that person is really, really strong, physically strong. They have some talent. When we say talent, it's just another code word for genetics. Okay, so if somebody has very, very good genetics, maybe they they have a long reach, maybe they have really, really good eyes. You know, they see stuff like they see punches. Like you could teach two students the same counter punch, one of them executes it far more successfully than the other. Why? He has better eyes, better reflex. It all counts, okay? Talent counts, but sometimes somebody with less talent will work really, 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 really hard and they'll even out against a guy who has talent. Now, when you have talent, sometimes I notice like they rely on it, right? They get lazy. Like they got the better of the guy in practice, so they're like, oh, I'm, I'm the better guy in the practice room. So they kind of train less. They come to practice late. They don't train as much. And all of a sudden, the guy that they've been beating up for a year or two, all of a sudden starts to have even matches with and all of a sudden, a year later, the guy who was less talented is winning. Why? Because the guy who was less talented was like, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting sick of getting my ass kicked. You know, I'm going to do what it takes to get ahead. So he, gets, he has that drive to work more. Now, it's not always the case. I tell you guys, don't underestimate talent. Talent is paramount, but hard work is also something very special. So a great example of that, I would say, is RDA. Uh, you know, he lost to Gamrat, actually, that, that, that in UFC 229. However... When he first started in UFC, let me go look at his record. Okay, he had quite a losing record. Hold on a second. I remember he lost to Clay Guida. He got tapped out because he had a broken jaw. Clay Guida put him down. He's 21 and 14 in UFC. 21 wins in UFC. Nothing to, uh, nothing to look down on here. That's an incredible uh, feat. Okay, let's look at his early stage in UFC. Okay. Let's look at it here. Oh, he got knocked out by Jeremy Stevens. I'm telling you, one of the worst knockouts I've ever seen. A horrible uppercut. Caught him clean. Knocked him out in round three. It was vicious. He lost to Tyson Griffin. Then later on, he won three fights in a row. Lost to Clay Guida. Won against George... Uh, hold on a second. It skipped on me. George Sotteropoulos. Then he lost to... He won against George Sotteropoulos. Then lost to Gleason Tebow. So he had a, he had a good handful of losses. And then he comes back to become world champion and beat Anthony Pettis. And he was a major underdog. I remember him being a major underdog when he fought Anthony Pettis. There are so many Cinderella stories like that. You know, guys who didn't do well early on. And then you see them work hard, work hard, reinvent themselves, come back to win and become world champion. That's actually quite incredible. Michael Bisping is another great example. Yes, he beat Luke Rockhold. The first time he fought Rockhold, he looked... Nowhere near the level. He, he didn't look like he belonged in the same arena as Rockhold. Then he came back to knock him out in round one. So Bisbing is another great example. Absolutely. Uh, Le Doublé. Thank you very much. I very, really appreciate that. I thought Peter, Peter Yan won the fight when he fought Sean. That's from Osama. I don't want to open up that can of worms, but I rewatched that fight recently. He definitely won. I thought Peter Yan won that fight. No doubt about it. If they fought again, I would pick... Uh, Peter Yan, even though I did think that Sean O'Malley looked better than ever, he's made some great improvements. He won that fight against Cheeto, not an easy fight. Obviously, Cheeto's a killer. 
He's a machine. However, he made it look easy. Even though Cheeto is one of the best battle weights um, in the game today. It was 30-27, coach, for MVP. That's from Rainbow. Not really, honestly. I thought I thought uh, Holland got around. Coach, how do you start evening class in Ramadan? Okay, guys, I know this is like the question every Ramadan I get it, so I'm going to answer it. I'm going to make an ex exception here, guys. This year in Ramadan, because it's not, it's not the sun is not setting so late. I break my fast in the gym, and then I give I while I'm giving my class when the uh, it's Maghrib time, I break my fast. I finish teaching my class. I don't really train too much at night. I might do a little weights. I might roll one or two rounds, but I'm not doing much at night, okay? Because it is Ramadan. It is tough. So I'm feeling a little bit, you know, like I, I need to rest more. I don't have as much energy. During the day, I, t I teach my classes as usual, okay? Nothing changes for me in my schedule. I'll do technique. I'll drill. I'll do a little bit of conditioning, but I won't roll too much. I rolled a bit on Monday. I did two rounds, but I felt I had enough. Normally, I would do three, four, maybe five rounds plus conditioning, but... Now, because it's Ramadan, I'm doing a lot less. I'm doing less than 50%. Okay, so I really recommend for those of you who are observing Ramadan, really lower your training. But I also don't break the my training routine. You know, I still go to practice. I still uh, I still do my routine. I just don't do it as intensely. It's that simple. Coach, do you think Cardi Cody Cody Garprant will win. Let's see who he's fighting. I don't know who he's fighting. Let's see. Let me look it up. Who's Cody Garbrandt fighting next? Let's see here. Oh, he's fighting uh, Figueiredo. Wow. Oh, that's UFC 300. Interesting. Interesting. Let's look at that card, actually. Oh, yes, yes. I really want to see Gaethje versus Holloway. This is going to be extremely exciting. I think that should have been even the main event. Oh, this is a great card. Bo Nickel, Brendage, Charles Oliveira, Armin Tarkirian. That's a very interesting fight. I'm picking Tarkirian for that one. Jiri is back versus Rakic. That's a really good fight. I think I picked Jiri. Kelvin Ketar versus Aljamain Sterling. A very, very interesting fight. That is going to be very interesting. Holly Holm versus Kaylee, Kayla Harrison. Very, very interesting. This is a, such a great card. Lopez versus Yusuf. That's interesting. I mean, this is going to be a great, great card. Meikano versus Jalil Turner. Wow. That's going to be wild. Bobby Green, Jim Miller. Two vets. Two hardcore vets. This is going to be great. Andrade Rodriguez and Cody Garbrandt versus Figuer Figueredo. Wow, that's a tough one. Man. That's a tough win. That's a tough win. If Cody Garbrandt pulls this off, it's going to be very impressive. Very tough fight for Cody. <clears throat> Coach for president, Omar. <laughs> one day, you never know, hopefully. <laughs> you think Cheeto would win if we would see round six or seven? That's from MMA guy. No, I think he was, th those knees that he was eating, he'd eventually get he'd get stopped he didn't look like he was getting going I don't think he could really hurt or slow down O'Malley it just wasn't he wasn't ready for that style okay guys we're doing questions and answers only on this fight give me your comments and questions on on the UFC 299 okay JDM won with a broken arm. What is what is his ceiling? That's from Fight Milk. Did he break his arm in the fight? I didn't hear that he broke his arm. Um, he looked like he was fine to me. I didn't notice it, so it's possible he fractured his arm. It's possible it happens in fights, but listen, he did get taken on quite a bit. So there are guys out there in the welterweight division that will take him down repeatedly. I mean, could you imagine if he fought an Usman or a Kamzat? Goodness gracious, you know. I mean. I think he could, he really needs to up his wrestling, and he will. I'm sure he will. He'll go back to the drawing board. I have no doubt. The next fight, he'll be much more ready for that. This is super chat. Okay, did that one. 
Salam from Algeria. Thank you, Shakib. I just actually ate Algerian dates tonight. Lots of Algerian dates. Good stuff. All right, guys. Give me some comments and questions on these fights. Yan looked good. He absolutely did. Yan, yeah, so did Song. Song Yadong looked very, very good. Extremely good. It was a very close fight. I had Song ahead at the beginning, but Yan and his takedowns and his pressure just kept he just kept one upping him over and over again. Cody is a big underdog. Yes, I believe it. Um, Fig Figueredo is going to be a handful for him. Uh, very difficult fight for Cody. Jack Della trains with Craig Jones. That's from Harrington Ripata. Yeah, he might, but he still has a lot of work to do. You know, it doesn't mean because you train with the best guy, you might not have had it. He, he doesn't have the same level, uh, years of experience as Gilbert. Gilbert's been doing jiu-jitsu uh, longer and at a higher level. So... Of course, training with Craig Jones is a good idea. It's just going to take time for him to develop the competence. You know, it doesn't matter if you, it does matter who you're training with, absolutely, but it still takes time. Even if you have the best coach in the world, it still takes time. The learning process, it's not done overnight. Do you favor Dustin or Justin if they fight again? That's from Terry Bird. That's a toss up. I would give that a 50 50. I would give that fight a 50 50. Coach, why did Dustin's guillotine keep failing? That's from Omar Q. It's quite crazy, but he's making the same mistake over and over again because he's going... It, he, look, when you do a guillotine, let, let's say... Let's say this is the back of my... Let's say I'm, I'm grabbing a guy in a guillotine. Imagine my head is in a guillotine, okay? Now, this is the armpit, right? Your head is under the armpit. If you slide up like so, and you push the head down, you're really choking the guy. But the head could slip out, okay? So the more, the more, you, the more you're up at the crown of the head like so, the more pressure... However, the more you lose control, so it's more aggressive, but less control. So you want to start here. Like when a guy's pulling his head out of, out of your guillotine, you got to keep your shoulder here. Okay, the armpit, the shoulder is here. And then when the guy settles down, you slowly creep up, slowly. He's going, he's going straight here, and that's why he's losing it. Okay, so he's just, it's really a question of starting at the, at the base of the skull and then bending the neck slowly inch by inch i teach it in guillotine made basic make sure to pick that up guys i also released two kimura videos recently check out jujiclub.com make sure you use level up 50 to get 50 percent off anything at jujiclub.com and make sure to use that promo code and also guys don't forget we have the t we have the dorms the tristar dorms for those of you who want to train at tristar gym and the dorms make sure i'm putting the promo i'm putting the email email tsdorms at gmail.com and make sure to message them and let them know you want to train at the TriStar Gym. I'm there every day, six days a week. Come and train with me and all the pros at TriStar Gym. Coach, I'm 25, two years. I haven't fought yet. Everyone always says I'm ready, but I'm not yet confident with my skills. A lot of my moves I pull off are from being explosive, athletic, but not skilled. Advice, question mark. Yeah, you know, do technique every day. Like, face your face your fears. Face your demons, man. Do technique every single day. Like, why aren't you skilled? If you're explosive and you're an athlete, why aren't you going in the gym and drilling every day? If you don't have the passion and fire to drill every day, if it doesn't excite you, then don't, don't be a fighter. Because once you get to higher levels, they're all explosive. They're all strong. They all have, like, athletic abilities. You know, you're rarely going to see a guy who's not athletic and, you know, a regular Joe at higher levels. So... Unless you're happy with just winning a few regional fights. You know, you do two, three fights. You, you're a hobbyist. You did it for fun. You put up a picture on behind your desk and you're like, you know, you're happy with yourself. And that for you is exciting. It's good enough. But if you really want to go far, you're going to have to really become technical. Could MVP outstrike top of welterweights like Robert Whitaker or Israel? Love from Aden. Uh, Jabarti, that's a good question. He could because of his reach and all that, but don't forget he's a welterweight. Those are middleweights you're talking about. So, um, are you saying if you think he could go up? He definitely has a frame. F uh, wait a second. Hold on a second. Yeah, well, he, he how tall? How tall is Venom Page? Hold on. MVP. How tall is he? Let's see here. 
Hold on. Six foot three, guys. Six foot three. He could definitely fight middleweight. Like he's got the reach, he's got the size, he's got the height. But I, I think at at middleweight he will get taken down. Like the top guys will just take him down over and over again. Like Holland took him down quite comfortably every so often. He took Holland down as well. But I mean UFC has so many good wrestlers. It's not like Bellator. Bellator has a few good wrestlers, but UFC is just filled with wrestlers. Just everywhere. Every corner you look, there's a good wrestler. So it's just it's gonna be hard for him to 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 do anything at middleweight. Is Peter Yan's style good? He is a super slow starter. That's from Shakur. I think his style is great. It's a, it works for him beautifully, but he's a five-round fighter. Don't forget, he fought so many five rounds, so he has to readjust now to three rounds. Three rounds is so much shorter. Ten minutes is a long time to take off the top. So he's got to readjust. I think his trainers have to readjust him to a three-round tempo. Okay, guys, it seems like in 27 minutes we did the fights. Nobody's really uh, asking or commenting too much on the fights. I'm not sure exactly what you guys want to, uh, if you guys want to move on, but let's open it up for anything you want. Okay, guys, now we're officially in the Ask Me Anything period of the uh, podcast. Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Guys, I'm not excited about that fight at all. I saw the headline. I'm like, Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's almost 60 years old. I guarantee you they're going to get him on hormones, guys. This is 100%. They're going to get Mike Tyson on hormones. So maybe Mike Tyson's going to look better than ever. He's going to crush Jake Paul. But I don't think I want to see that either. Like, why do you want to see a guy 57 years old, juiced up, fighting a young kid? I think Jake Paul now has to stop <laughs> stop with his antics. It's getting old. You know, I think he's got to start fighting some legitimate guys. He's, he's, a, he's a good boxer. He's got to fight guys with his level of experience, a fair fight. And just like build his record, build his name, build his reputation. These novelty fights are getting boring. Like I don't think, I don't know how many people watched him when he fought Anderson Silva. I don't. I think less people are gonna watch him fight Mike Tyson. I didn't watch his fight with Anderson Silva. I saw a few clips here and there because they were all over the internet. But I don't think people were as excited as excited. You know, like it wasn't like the first time when he was fighting Ben Askren, Woodley. Okay, there was a lot of drama and people kind of tuned in. But I think these fights are getting old for me. I'm not super excited about it. It's an exhibition match on top of it. There you go. It's getting gimmicky. You know, like, why don't you just fight somebody? Now, you made your name. We know who you are. Fight somebody legitimate. I mean, the last guy he fought, I mean, that was, like, ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. I mean, a guy who's way past his prime. Not The guy didn't look like he was training at all. It's just abs absurd. I also saw... Um, Francis Ngannou's fight with uh, Joshua. Man, Ngannou didn't look like himself. You know, he just didn't look like himself. I was really confident for Ngannou to do a lot better than that. And uh, Anthony Joshua just proved everybody wrong. You know, like, it just showed, like, T Tyson's Fury's performance was so bad. And Ngannou's performance was so good. So I thought Ngannou beat Tyson Fury. And Tyson Fury should have done better. You and Ganu's going into his world. And Ganu was going to Tyson Fury's world. And Tyson Fury was struggling. I thought Ngannou won that fight. So you, it's like you you imagine an MMA guy losing to, I don't know, a boxer who doesn't do MMA. Comes in our sport and just wipes the floor with us. I would be embarrassed. I would. But uh, against Anthony Joshua, Ngannou got, you know, he got beat. He got beat soundly. And I was still surprised because I really believe Ngannou could do a lot better than that. Hey, coach, how to have a good guillotine MMA and how to have a good striking like Jack Della Mandalena? That's a very general question. You got to box every day on a regular basis. And if you're really interested in guillotine, you got to really develop your guillotine by practicing it, learning all the go train with the top guillotine masters, get guillotine instructionals and really practice that maneuver every day. It's, there's no secret to it. It's just daily, daily practice and really having really, really good trainers. If you have really, really good trainers and you commit commit those techniques to memory and you drill them on a regular basis and you work out the nuances 
eventually you will be an incredible guillotine artist and boxer. You know, it's all about practice. There's no secret to it. It's all about practice. Should Pedro Munoz retire? I think so. But what do you think? That's from Logan Show. Listen, I saw his last fight. He lost. And, uh, you know, he, it was almost a one-sided fight. I thought he had a good first half of the first round. Other than that, I think Kyler Phillips took over. But I don't think he should retire. No, I think he should go back to the drawing board. He didn't get hurt. He didn't get beat up badly. You know, he didn't get injured. You know, he lost, but he didn't get beat up badly. There's no there's no shame in him going back to the drawing board, figuring out what happened, figuring out what went wrong, what he could do better next time, and give it another try. I totally think he can uh, redeem himself from this loss. You don't think Gaethje versus Holloway is a mismatch? Is a mismatch? I'm a little worried for Max. That's from Joey. Gaethje's bigger. Gaethje hits hard. But Max Holloway is also an incredible phenom. Don't forget, he was well, he was featherweight champion several times over, defended his crown. I think he's still arguably the greatest featherweight of all time. Like I mean, it's between him, Jose Aldo, and Alexander Volkanovsky. That's a debate we've talked about on this channel several times. I mean, I still don't know who I would pick as the greatest of all time. I'd have to sit down and think about it. I have to go through their footage. I'd have to really think about it. You know, because that's like that's a crazy title. Who's the greatest featherweight of all time? It's the, one of those three. And Gaethje never dominated the 155 division. What I'm trying to say is pound for pound is Max Holloway, in my opinion, is greater. You give up the weight advantage. Now we got ourselves a fight. But I've heard that Max Holloway's put on weight the right way. Supposedly he's saying he's putting on weight the right way. He's taking the weight. Because Max Holloway has a long frame. Like I've been next to Max Holloway. I've been to just next to Justin Gaethje. Max is uh, he's tall. He's a little bit taller, but also Max, if he filled out that frame with some muscle, he'd be he'd be big, man. He's a big guy. Um, very strange, very difficult. I would think he probably. I think you know if you told me he's one forty five, I would be like, man, that's gonna be tough to make one forty five. He's a big guy. Max Holloway's a big, imposing athlete. He's a, quite an athlete. If he puts the weight on correctly, I think it could even out the advantage that Gaethje has on him. But here's the thing, you know, Max Holloway doesn't often win by knockout. He wins by volume, volume, volume. So if we go to decision, Holloway. Now, Holloway's never been knocked out. He's never been knocked out cold. He's never been really even dropped. Like, can we even think of somebody who dropped him? Nothing comes to mind. So I think he's, it's going to be a tough fight. You think Cody Sanhagen beats Sugar Sean if Sean beats Marab? That's from Andrew. That's a that would be an interesting fight. Cody Sanhagen versus Sean O'Malley be almost a mirror match. A very similar fighting style, both those men. I'd have to go through their footage and, and watch it, watch their footage closely, but that would be a very, very close fight. I want to start jujitsu because I'm pretty flexible, but I'm scared about someone ripping a sub on my first day. That's from Andrew. Andrew, just find a gym with a basics class. That's it. Find a gym with a basics course. And in the basics course, they're not going to rip your arm off. So you shouldn't have to worry about it. Aloha, coach. I'm 33, former fighter and passionate about coaching, mostly striking. Should I start my own gym or learn and help build someone else? Question mark. That's from Watts. Watts, I will tell you, don't build your own gym just yet. Go into the gym. Join a class, work out, see if you can start coaching as an assistant or just helping people out, giving pointers. See if it's if you measure up. You know how much of kickboxing do you know? You didn't you didn't state, but if you can spar with people and you know you're doing really well, people start asking you for tips, start asking for coaching. Let it happen naturally is what I'm saying. Like don't open up your own school to find out nobody wants to train with you. You know you don't have a passion for training. Join a gym, find out. Hey, do people kind of like gravitate towards me when they need help? If so. Consider opening yourself a gym, but get your get yourself in a gym first. Figure it out in the gym, you know, before you uh, get in the airplane. Make sure it's all well tested. Coach, how do you create a gym environment like TriStar? You're the man. Coach, love you from <laughs> England. Thank you, the Jabarti. Look, at TriStar, it's it's a very good atmosphere. It's very friendly, but I think it's the, it's all about the instructors. You know, always talk to the instructors. Make sure that they follow the rules. Everybody has respect for everyone else. We all respect each other. It's a question of having having the correct rules and then enforce it. And the instructors and every instructor, including myself, the owner of the gym, everybody follows the rules. You know, you have to come in the gym. You have to be clean. 
You have to respect the rules of the gym. We all take turns mopping. We all take turns organizing, you know, the gym, etc. When we roll, it's safety first. Everybody rolls with everybody. You know, it's it's just like we kind of make rules where we try to make everybody feel welcome. You know, absolutely everybody feel welcome. And of course, in Canada, we have every walk of life from every corner of the world, and we try to we try to accommodate everybody's differences. Have to admit, it's fighting in front of a crowd that scares me. I heard you talk about fighters freezing and fear for getting what I know in a fight. That's from Aries. Aries, it's true. You're, that's a very good point. You know, sometimes you put guys to spar and they're relaxed in the gym and they feel good. Now, some people are nervous for sparring, but people get past that and all of a sudden sp sparring is not a big deal. They spar every week and then you go on fight night and the guy's petrified the guy doesn't want to walk make the walk like he's petrified you could see it on his face he's totally nervous and you got to ask yourself what's different what's the difference between sparring and fight night what's the difference there's one major difference fight night the promoter is hyping up everything it's all hype man they put on music they bring in girls with cars they bring in cameras they, you, all your friends are there everybody's talking you can hear the crowd you can hear the crowd from the back room, you know, like you can, you know, on regional shows especially, you can hear them cheering for the fights, etc. It's like all that hype, all that noise, all that attention is really what's scaring you because fighting, you're doing it on a weekly basis. Yeah, the gloves are bigger and sparring, but I mean, like it doesn't really hurt when you get hit, okay? I'll tell you something. Other than body shots, like getting punched in the face doesn't hurt. It's just kind of like you might see a spark, you might get a little woozy, but it's not it's not painful. It's not a painful experience. And if you get knocked out, it's not painful. You just wake up and you're like, hey, what happened? But it's not It's not something like, you're not in agony. Okay, now, there are exceptions. Sometimes you break your orbital. That's going to hurt later. Sometimes you break your jaw. Believe me, that's going to hurt later. But other than something major, like most fights, most, when I'll tell you like 80, 85% of fights, there's no pain really involved. Now, when you get kicked in the leg, it hurts, yes, but it's not something like, I don't think people are so scared of the pain per se. I think it's really the hype, the hype of the fight, the announcer screaming your name, the people all staring, watching, judging your every little movement. It's all hype. It's all like drama, drama, drama. I think the best fighters, they put that to the side. They totally, they totally focus on the fight and completely, completely ignore the hype. Like the promoter's job is to hype up the fight. The commentator is to hype up the fight. The commentator like... If you like throw a jab, he was gonna be like, "Oh my, what a jab!" You know, he's gonna he's gonna like hype it up. If you like slipped and fell in the fight, they're like, "Oh my God, is he hurt?" They're trying to create drama. They're trying to create excitement. But you you got to be in your mind. You got to be like, "Okay, that's theater. That's all for the fans. That's all for like people who are here Saturday night. They want entertainment. That's for entertainment. What's my job? I gotta find this chin. I gotta sprawl. I gotta." escape this guillotine i gotta defend the single leg i gotta do my job i gotta forget about the hype the hype is for that's the promoter's job that's the commentator's job that's the uh, you know that's the fans they're gonna like fall in love with that me i'm not gonna fall in love with that i'm gonna go and do my job it doesn't matter how much hype they put behind it the lights the camera the you know the they're gonna they're gonna put a light show and all that they're gonna announce you in a way they're gonna put your face on the screen they're all trying to make it look bigger than it is. They're trying to make the event look bigger than it is. At the end of the day, it's a sparring match. But you can fall into the romance. If you fall into the romance, man, I don't know what's going to happen with you. You know, you're going to get emotional. You're going to start making mistakes. You're going to you're not going to fight like you did in the gym. So that's why I'm a big believer in like making sure we don't fall into the hype and the romance and the posters and the talk, the pre-fight talk, the interviews and the articles like <laughs> sometimes people send me articles about the fight we're, we're going to fight people say oh did you hear what this guy said dude I don't even care oh did you hear what they said they think that this and that I don't even care I don't even I don't even want to know I don't even want to read it I don't even want to listen to it why I know what I'm doing you know what you're doing we're athletes we're professionals here we're competing at the highest level we know a lot about our opponent we obviously you know who you're fighting right you got about eight weeks to get ready for him we know about the hype we know this hype is coming but some fighters fall too much into the romance and I think it horribly affects their performance. Hey coach, I'm 19. Too late to start MMA career? That's question mark. That's from Sun. 
unless you're very talented, like if you're if you're a talented, hardworking guy, it's not too late. I'm 21 and super skinny. That's from Andrew. <laughs> you say that like it's a bad thing. Listen, there's two great ways to bulk up, okay? One, sprinting, and two, squats. I prefer sprinting. So I do a lot of sprinting during the week. I'll probably, like, I like air bike and uh, running as well. And I'll probably do two, three sprints a week, but short, intense. It's very good for raising testosterone. Extremely, extremely good. MVP versus Wonder Boy. What would happen? Question mark. Uh, that's a good question. Look, I think I think MVP and Wonder Boy will be a great match, fantasy match. They're two like karate masters. MVP is incredible at karate, but I think Wonder Boy will do a lot better in MMA. I think Wonder Boy is a lot harder to take down, so he could beat a lot of MMA guys that I don't think MVP could beat. So if you want to compare them in that sense, I would pick Wonder Boy. A straight up karate master fight, karate master versus karate master, man. Who knows? They're both. Uh, it's gonna be a. It's gonna be a barn burner. That would be like a very difficult fight to call. Incredibly difficult. Okay, what else we got here, guys? Give me something interesting. What's your opinion on body recomposition? That's from Emin. Like I said, look, the most important... You know, I, when I recently... I just bought a glute a glute ham raise machine. Uh, sorry, no, a hip thruster machine. Is that what they call it? Hold on a second. Hold on, I'll tell you right now. Exactly. This is a fantastic machine. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. The the hip thrust machine. It's a really, really good machine. I'm I, I don't do a lot of machines. There are some machines I like. I bought a hip thruster machine. Why? Why do I use the hip thruster machine? Because it saves your back. Like back squatting is very good. Deadlifting is very good. I like deadlifting, especially use, using a trap bar. But if you deadlift too much, which deadlifting and squatting is very good for testosterone. Okay, super, super good. But I don't feel like in deadlift every day or squat every day, and then go wrestle. I feel my back is too tight. But hip thruster machine, it works the similar muscles in a squat, but it doesn't emphasize the back as much, the lower back. So what happens is I can squat my with my legs every day now. Well, not squat. When I say squat, I mean hip thruster. I can work that squat motion using the hip thruster, but not taxing my lower back as much. So now I've been doing a bit of hip thruster every day and I feel a massive difference in my legs. Like my legs are much stronger now, much, much stronger. When I'm grappling, I feel like if I put a triangle choke on somebody or have somebody in mount, my legs are locked. Like they're so much stronger than before. Why? Because I'm, I'm giving him a daily dose now of hip thruster. So whereas if I can only do a, a deadlift once every week or every two weeks, I wouldn't deadlift as much because the recovery time is great on a deadlift, on a squat. You know, you, you, you can only deadlift once, twice a week. And how heavy can you go? But with the hip thruster machine, I can go much heavier. I can do it daily. I do a few sets a day. That's outside the rest of my conditioning. So if I do, let's say, an air bike workout, I'll go on the hip thruster machine after. I'll do a few hip thrusters. And I really feel like I can build my legs without taxing them. Oh, boy. I missed the super chat. Hold on a second. Hold on a second, guys. Any thoughts? Any tough guys trying you or fighters you know off? What? <laughs> are trying me, like challenging me? No, not really. No, most guys who walk in the gym are very respectful. I've had, you know, a few scuffles here and there throughout the years, but nothing major. In Strong and Stable Back, you talk about Zercher Squat, but not Zercher Deadlifts. How would you, I approach a Zercher Deadlift? It's a rounded back movement. No, I don't recommend, Hassan Haytham, I don't recommend you do Zercher deadlift with a rounded back. Like, it's going to be very tough to do a Zercher deadlift. Now, you could do a Zercher good morning. You put the bar in your arms, okay, and then you kind of walk back. You open your legs in a split, and then you, you do a Zercher. 
kind of good morning with your the bar in your hands, but you got to go light. Like I don't really emphasize, I don't really think you should do that too much because you're playing with fire. You'd have to have like perfect technique. You'd have to hip hinge perfectly. You know, I talk about hip hinge and strong and stable back. Guys, strong and stable back is arguably the best video ever made. Like you guys got to get strong and stable back. Over 80% of people have back pain throughout their life. Strong and stable back is one of probably the best material out there. Make sure to get it. It's very important. And yes, Zercher squat is very, very good. Okay, guys, I'm doing super chats and non-super chats. It's the secret of success. Only hard work, intelligent work, or just God blessing. I'm assuming you mean God-given gifts. Yeah, it's all those three things. Hard work, genetics, yes, God-given gifts, and uh, being intelligent. Yeah, of course, the more intelligent you are, those are all good things. Coach, please check out this Ramadan gift PDF, 100 Miracles. Save it in a tab and read it later. I'll send it in chat after this message. Okay, go ahead, brother. Please do. You could have put it in the super chat, I imagine. Go ahead. Coach, your thoughts on headstands. That's from Waymast. I absolutely love it. Fantastic way to train your neck. It's a super important skill to have. You should be able to post on your head. You you got to do it in wrestling and jiu-jitsu all the time. MMA fighting, when you're fighting, you're pinning somebody down. Sometimes you got to post on your head when you jump from one side of the body to the other. It's a super strong way to develop your neck. And also, it's a required skill. If you see wrestlers, they do a lot of neck bridging. Instead of neck bridging, because neck bridging, you're putting a load on your neck and then you're oscillating back and forth. That can really abuse the, the vertebrae in your neck. Personally, I don't like to put my neck under a load and then flex. Okay, so I, I, I put loads, I put a load around my neck and I push and I pull, but I never flex. In strong and stable neck, I talk about not going more than a quarter inch. Okay, so I like headstand because it's a static, isometric maneuver for the neck. I have a very, very good neck. I have very few neck injuries. And uh, for the amount of training I do, I have a super, super healthy neck. I highly recommend headstands. Yeah, absolutely. But they have to be done correctly. When you do headstands, you don't want to be on the top of your head. You want to be on your forehead. Okay, that's the way they do it in gymnastics. And you keep your neck aligned properly. You won't get injured. Message retracted. Oh, boy. Influx of super chats. Okay, no one. I'm six foot two with a 73 inch reach. Coach always teaching striking, assuming the taller guy has a longer reach. Most guys shorter than me have the same. Is it not, if not longer reach, what do I focus on? Think hook up build. <laughs> what? Coaches always teach striking, assuming the taller guy has a longer reach. Okay, you're saying you have a shorter, you're a taller guy with a shorter reach. Um, Who used to fight like that? I gotta think. That's actually very uncommon to be the taller guy in the shorter reach. Look, I would recommend you learn infighting, you know, like study infighting and see if you can get it to work for you. You know, you just got to exp you got to experiment with different fighting styles. And I will tell you, try to find an, a fighter that was successful with your with your body type and try to mimic him. Salam, coach. I'm doing one meal a day and Ramadan fasting. Is this healthy? That's from Kani Bayev. Look, if you're training intensely, I personally, I don't like one meal a day. I like to do one meal a day when I have a day off. So let's say on Sundays, I'm not training. I won't eat sometimes. I won't eat the whole day. I'll just have one supper. I'll eat my supper. That's it. But if you're training, I don't like it. I think it's too restrictive. Now, I've heard some athletes have a lot of success with one meal a day at a high, high level. So I don't want to knock it. You got to try it and do it yourself. I personally like eating uh, eight hour window sometimes uh, less sometimes six hour window but having all my food in one meal i think could be a little excessive if i'm training if you're not training if you're just fasting having one meal a day i think it's fantastic is hicks and gracie and john denahar the highest thinking minds in jiu-jitsu also what do you think about greg solder's ecological approach oh yes i've heard of uh, greg solder's hold on a second let me look him up real quick He like plays games, right? Somebody was telling me about this. Greg Sauters, is it like games and stuff? I 
I'm gonna have to look him up. But somebody was telling him me about him uh, very recently. Here's the thing: I heard he doesn't drill, but he kind of plays like learning based games. You gotta ask yourself this, okay? Look at the top 100 wrestling teams in history. What did they do? Did they drill or did they play game game uh, objective based games? Which one did they do? I will tell you, they all drilled. Okay, now look at the number one judoka teams in history. What did they do? Did they drill or did they play like goal oriented games? They all drilled, all of them, all of them, every single one of them. Do you think there wasn't teams out there that tried? Hey, let's try a different approach. Let's try to play, you know, uh, goal goal oriented games. I don't. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm just saying it might. It either doesn't work. They've tried it before, or we haven't discovered it yet. That's the question. So if we haven't discovered it yet, if nobody's tried it, he might be onto something. And but it's very likely people have tried it, failed it, and then just started drilling again. So time will tell is what I'm trying to say. Okay, I don't want to be a closed mind here. I'm keeping the open-minded spirit. He could have come across a better way. And there are there must be a better way. There always is a better way. Um, it's just discovering it is not easy. So we'll wait and see. We have to wait and see in his results. Uh, in my opinion, uh, John Denahar is the greatest jiu-jitsu mind ever, in my opinion. Salam alaikum, coach. I bought strong and stable knees. However, it seems to have However, I seem to have torn something in my knee last night during a roll. Don't know whether it's meniscus or ligament tear. I'm still able to walk though. Any advice? That's from Sean. Sean, I will go see my doctor, get the test. He's going to test your knee. He's going to give you an idea. Make sure you work the stability ball progressions. Over over time, you'll rebuild your knee. Uh, however, I fear if it is a, leg, a torn ligament, depending on which one, Um, you might need surgery, okay? So personally, what I would tell you is do a deep research. Find out what you have exactly. Now, if you're walking around and you don't feel like your knee is loose, that's a really good sign, okay? If you tore your MCL or your LCL, that's also a really good sign. So the ligament's on the side of your knee, okay? So on the side, okay? So your right side or your left side, that's not so bad. Rarely ever needs surgery. The one to fear is ACL and PCL. If you tore your ACL or your PCL, that's bad. Okay, so I don't want to tell you, uh, I can't I can't diagnose you over, obviously I can't diagnose you, but you should go see your doctor, he'll do the test, he'll kind of check your knee, he'll do a test, and then if he has a doubt, he'll ask for MRI. However, if it's meniscus, in my opinion, don't do any surgery for meniscus. I've torn my meniscus in both my knees, my knees are perfectly healthy, super strong, no pain whatsoever. I know so many people who've torn meniscus, I always tell them, don't do the meniscus surgery, it's not worth it. I've done surgery on one leg and surgery, no, no, no surgery on the other. And the one I did repair with surgery just tore after like six months. It just tore again. So both my knees, meniscus is shredded. I have zero pain. I feel super healthy. I just do a strongest table knee program and I have zero pain, zero arthritis in my knee, nothing. Like I have my, my knees are like a 20 year old man's knees. Um, if you If you tore meniscus, that's pretty normal for a grappler. Very normal. Okay, it's very, very normal. It's going to happen. If you're a grappler and you're wrestling seriously, eventually your meniscus is going to tear. It's not that big of a deal. People make a big deal out of it. But for me, I don't see a meniscus tear as a big deal at all. <laughs> Water asks, this is the question of the night, how to deal with lust? <laughs> That's the age-old question, my friend. That's an age-old question. You got to go back to the book of Genesis to, to, to answer that one. That's an old, that's an old, that's a man's first problem. <clears throat> I don't see it going away either. <clears throat> I'll let you know the answer when I figure it out. <laughs> Did you see Hoyce Gracie convert to Islam? That's from Hassan Haytham. Yes, I did. Actually, congratulations to him. Welcome, Hoyce Gracie, to the Muslim Brotherhood. Congratulations. I'm really happy to hear uh, he converted to Islam. I'm really happy. I've met him. I've hung out with him several times. He seems like a very sweet person, genuine person. And for him to do that, I think, was uh, quite special. Because, <laughs> anyways, I don't want to get into the whole drama. But there was a drama with him. And then uh, I think he did a 180. And he realized, hey, you know what? I wasn't I wasn't aware of the topic. I wasn't aware of the issues. Now that I'm hearing both sides, I see it this way. It makes more sense to me. And he says, look, he accepted Islam. He embraced Islam. So I'm really happy for him and uh, welcome him. 
How does sprinting inc increase bulk? Wouldn't it be the opposite? Question mark. That's from Andrew. Andrew, if you do long running, yes, you'll get smaller. Okay, so let's say you're a boxer and you barely fit in your weight class or you're an MMA fighter. I'll make you do longer runs, okay, because you got to trim down. you got to lose the weight. We're trying to fit in this weight class. You're too muscular for your weight class. And for some reason, we judge that this weight class is right for you. Then we're going to do long runs. Now, short explosive runs have the opposite effect. If you do short explosive runs, your body's not going to be in a, in a catabolic state, okay? It's going to go into an anabolic state, okay? You're putting the full, like, you're, you're pulling your full energy in a short period. You're doing bursts of energy. You will not lose any, any muscle at all. You're going to put on muscle, especially if you do sprints and then weights together. Sprinting and weights together, you're going you're gonna to create hypertrophy. Do you still stand by your statement, men that let their... Oh. <laughs> Verum, Verum asks, do you still stand by your statement, men that let their chicks train are less of a man? Then there, there was a lot of hate for that statement on YouTube. Well, you know what? I, I did retract that statement. I apologize for that statement. It's not how I wanted it to come out. I was kind of directing my statement to people who are criticizing me. So I was kind of like telling them to go to hell. But then I realized, hey, you know, I just generalized it to all these other people. So I, I backpedaled on my statements. But originally, I got a lot of criticism from people because I don't roll with women. People get really upset about me over this. Now. I will tell you, I get a lot of praise for it too. I get a lot of praise. People tell me, you're right. You should do it that way. That's the correct way. And then on the other hand, I get people who like just despise me just because I don't roll with women. It's my personal choice not to roll with women. And... I was kind of directing that at them, you know, you know, go to hell, you know, you guys want me to do all this. Well, you know, I was just kind of throwing venom at them, but I do apologize to the rest of the community who, you know, they don't judge others and uh, they go about their business. You know, I shouldn't have been making comments like that. So I did retract that a long time ago. Thoughts on Ayn Rand. <sighs> Ayn Rand, guys, for those of you who don't know, she's a, she's a very famous female philosopher, very famous. I don't think she brought anything new. I've never heard anything novel come out of her. Now, I've, I heard, I've, again, I have to be fair. I haven't read her famous works yet. I do plan on reading them. But I read, I listened to one of her interviews. Like She has interviews. And I was like, really, not really. I was really unimpressed with her level of thinking. I was really unimpressed. And that's hearing her talk live. I listened to, I think, like an hour of her interview. I was really not intrigued. So I didn't follow up on her work. Um, nothing she said, in my opinion, was profound. Nothing. So again, I'm 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 not judging her. I want to wait and see. I want to read her books, but uh, as of yet, I was not impressed. As of yet, coach, you missed my Ramadan gift super chat. Did I? I can't send it in a super chat. It, it is in the chat. Okay, well, I missed it, buddy. You're going to have to send it again. Spam it. How do I, Salam Coach, how do I get bigger, stronger legs ASAP? That's from Cal, Calisthenia. Guys, there's only one way to get bigger legs. You got to squat. You got to lunge. You got you to gotta deadlift. You got to do the core movements. No gimmicks. No gimmicks, guys. No gimmicks. Sprinting, squatting, deadlifting. Uh, running stairs, short, explosive bursts. The shorter, the better. So, f you know, really, really short, explosive exercises for your legs. I would tell you, look, I really like the hip, the hip thruster machine. If you have access to one, do hip thruster every day. Your legs are gonna grow because you could do hip hip flexor, hip thrust machine every day, and you won't burn out your nervous system. If you squat every day, you're gonna burn out your your nervous system. You're gonna have CNS overload. You're gonna feel tired. You're gonna have brain fog. You're going to feel lethargic. Not so with the hip thruster machine. The hip thruster machine really hits the legs. Not as much as a squat. Nothing will hit the legs as much as a squat. Okay, There's no study that shows they compare hip thrusters to squats. Hip thrusters are more gentle, but you could do them daily. If you do something daily, guys, you're going to have way more volume. If you get way more volume, you're going to have way more size. So I've been doing it recently. I bought a hip thruster machine. I put it in the gym. I absolutely love it. It's a fantastic, fantastic device. If you want to hypertrophy your legs, I would recommend sprinting and hip thruster machine on a regular basis. And you do it every day. A few sets a day, you won't burn your legs out. Is
Iftar is late in the UK and it's too hard to run my 5K during the day. Should I run before Suhoor at 3 a.m. considering I'd have to be up again for 8 a.m. at work? That's from Captain. Captain, you might burn yourself out. I really worry about that. I would recommend do air bike because you have all that food. After you do iftar, you're going to feel like lethargic a bit. Get on the air bike. Once you start pedaling, because the air bike, you're not jostling up and down. You know, Don't forget, when you're running, you're jostling up and down. It's very sensitive. The gut is going to be very sensitive. Your stomach was closed all day, and now you're opening it up. So I would tell you, after you break your fast, take a little break, rest, and then get on the air bike. If you get on an air bike, you can get an incredible workout, just like you would on a run. But you won't jostle all the food in your stomach. It's a much better way. So I would highly, highly recommend everybody out there. Everybody out there should own an air bike. If you're, fi if you're a fitness enthusiast, if you want to get in shape, air bike, running, and roll, those three are super important. If you have access to a roll machine, an air bike machine, and running, whether you're running on a treadmill or you're running on the streets or the roads or wherever, those are the three most important cardio exercises. Absolutely the three most important. Coach, advice on how to find your soulmate and how to approach her, him, slash. I like the girls, but she's out of, I like this girl, but she's out of my league. How should I approach her? But be brooding, be kind. Ramadan Mubarak. That's not Abdullah. <laughs> guys, what do you like in a woman? I'll tell you what you guys like in a woman. You like beauty. You like a beautiful girl. When you see a beautiful girl, she triggers all these this chain reaction in your mind and you can't think about anything else. Now, if she has a beautiful personality and she's a sweet person, that's also going to take you even over the top. Now, what do women like? Women like a man who can take care of her. And I know it's going to be controversial. A lot of people don't like hearing this, but this is the truth. And I got to talk to you guys like you're my younger brothers. I'll tell you something. Women love a man who can take care of her. So organize your career. You don't have to be the world's best looking guy. You don't have to be the most chiseled guy. You don't have to be the most. It helps to be handsome. It helps to be fit. Sure, it helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. Women love a guy who can defend her. Absolutely. Don't let nobody lie to you. Don't let all this new age woke uh, th philosophy infiltrate the way you think. I guarantee you, women love men who are strong, men who are very physically strong that can defend her, and a man who can take care of her. Like when the check comes, a man should be taking care of the check. <clears throat> a woman should be working, sure, if she wants to work, but she shouldn't have to spend her own money on bills. You know, like generally speaking, a woman will much prefer. I'm not saying it's not good for a woman to pay the house bills and chip in. Of course it's good. And of course, in today's economy, you need two salaries. Today's economy is almost, especially in Canada, it's Im almost impossible for two young kids get married. They both have diplomas. They work full time. They can't afford a house. Like that's how bad the market is in, in, in Canada now. Even like two full-time working couples. Like a couple gets married. They have a diploma. They have a good job. They can't afford a house. Like in Canada, when I bought a house, it was like way cheaper. And that was just like maybe 16 years ago. Sixty In 16 years, houses became unaffordable quickly. Like I would say in the last five, six, seven years, housing market has been out of, getting out of control. Now, it's not ideal for two people to work eight hours a day and, and, and burn themselves out and live paycheck to paycheck. It's not ideal, but it's doable. And you can have a successful relationship. Absolutely. No doubt. However, it's much easier if the man is able to pay everything and the woman doesn't have to pay anything. It's much easier on the relationship. It's much less strenuous and it's much easier to find a girl when you have your finances, you're fit, you can defend her. That's why, that's why I made the video a man's guide to throwing a punch. Every single man should be able to throw a punch. Every single man on earth. Not because you want to find trouble, but because if trouble ever comes your way, you're prepped. And here's the thing. One of the best ways to do cardio, if you're going to do a cardiovascular workout, the heavy bag, shadow boxing. The boxing workout is a great cardiovascular workout. It's fantastic. I don't care if you're a full-time grappler and you want to become the world's best grappler. You should also still know how to throw a punch. There's no man on earth i think that should not know how to throw a punch i think like when you if i if i if i made a curriculum for like if they asked me if they put me in charge of making a curriculum for young kids like okay what are they gonna learn how much math how much science how much geography i'll tell you one thing that's gonna be on that curriculum is gonna be grappling wrestling and how to punch why 
if everybody knows how to throw a punch, people won't want to fight each other. They'll be like, hey, wait a second. That guy's no easy target, man. He can make a fist and drop me on the chin and knock me out. Like, he could defend himself. If everybody can defend themselves, everybody will respect everybody else. And also, I would have, like, you know, combat sports because they get, young men will get their aggression out. There wouldn't be fights in the street. There wouldn't be no need for that. If you don't like a guy, glove up. Let's go in the ring. We're fighting each other every day anyway. Let's glove up. You know, it's a much safer, healthier way to expel aggression. Okay, but that's a second, separate point. Every man should be able to defend his woman. Every man should be able to provide for his woman. And I know it's an ugly thing to say. It's not a PR thing to say, but I'll tell you something. That greatly, greatly increases a woman's attraction. Greatly. And another thing I would say that's very important for a man to do, extremely important for a man to do, is to be emotionally stable. If you're too sensitive, I think women... Uh, find that unattractive. And I find that the modern man today, he's too sensitive. That's why he has so many women problems. And again, I know this is really not a popular thing to say, but a man should not be overly emotional. A man should be calm when there's a problem. You know, the basement is flooded. The man won't get overly emotional. Oh, uh, this bill came out of nowhere. He's not going to throw a fit and start yelling and screaming. He's very, very in control of his emotions. Now, I find men talk about their feelings too much. It's not wrong to talk about your feelings. I don't think it's wrong to express your feelings. I just think it's done at too high of a degree. And when you do that, and especially in front of women, I think you secretly turn them off. I think you turn off their attraction. And even though they won't admit it, but generally speaking, a man should not be so in touch with his emotions. That's just my own personal opinion. <clears throat> what else we got here? Coach, if all is in the mind, can you f form your own desired reality? Question mark. Also, realize Connor was big on this with his manifestation during his prime. That's from Sidder. No, you can't. In my opinion, you can't just like... I, I, listen, there's the thing. I'm not saying we live in my mind. I'm not saying we live in your mind. Okay. It's that's not what we're saying. We're saying there is a mind, and we live in the mind. Yes, okay. All we know is mind. This is very complex stuff, okay. And this mind, we don't have control over it. So I'm not saying you can program and control your destiny, like with like uh, the secret and stuff like that. No, not at all, not at all. Okay, I'll tell you how Berkeley said it. Berkeley said it well. Okay, now many great thinkers said it, but Berkeley said it well. He said, "Look, I have ideas in my mind, right?" They're kind of there, but they're not as vivid as these ideas, like the ideas around you. Like, for instance, this computer in front of me. Because according to Berkeley, all there is is mind and ideas. Okay, this glass here, this is really vivid. If I imagine this glass in my head, if I imagine it in my head, it's there, but it's not as vivid as this thing right here. So I'm imagining a glass in my head. I see it. It looks identical. It sounds the same. It tastes the same. Everything's the same. However, it's not as vivid. It's not as, it's not as real. He's saying, yeah, because those are your mind. Th that's your mind and your ideas. And this is in the mind of God and it's the idea of God. It's a creation of God. That's why it's so much more real. Now, how he got there, he's a brilliant man. Guys, don't like for some of you who are new to this, don't scoff at him. He's, he was a brilliant man. And believe me, his position was considered irrefutable. Many great minds tried to refute him. The man is a genius. Now, did I give it a nutshell and skip a bunch of steps? Yes, I did. But I'm just trying to give you you know, I'm trying to clarify what I said earlier. Okay, so not because I'm thinking of this glass breaking in my mind that it's going to break somehow in reality in this world, in the outside world. So you have the inner world in your mind and then you have this outside world you're living in. No matter wh what I think about this glass in my mind, it's not going to affect in the outside world. It's not going to affect this thing in the outside world. So he's definitely not saying that you can manifest your own realities, etc. No, I think that's a bit of a new age uh, gimmick. In a certain way, look, if you... If you set your mind right and you want to achieve your goals, yes, that makes a difference. But just imagining a million dollars falling into your lap won't bring a million dollars into your life. No. <clears throat> Coach, why didn't Cheeto shoot or grapple? That's from Barack. That's not his game, okay? He's, it's really not his game. He's a striker. If he shot and grappled, it, he would have shot probably from too far away and it would probably things would have got worse. Okay, now don't forget, O'Malley's fighting guys who want to take him down all the time, so he's ready for that. You know, it just would, I think, I think would have made things worse. 
it's not that easy to take a fighter down in, in the fight, okay? If you have, if you don't have a pedigree of wrestling, it's not easy. Now, do you think Cheeto would like wrestle for two months before his fight and, and drop all the striking, not sharpen his striking, and go in there and try to take O'Malley down? It wouldn't make any sense. He's not a wrestler. He would have like this. He would have improved his wrestling, but nowhere near enough to take O'Malley down. So why not just improve your striking and try to get into a gunfight with O'Malley? You know what I mean? Like, let's say you're a striker. Your forte is striking. You did all. You got all your success with striking. Now all of a sudden, in a world championship fight, you're gonna change the way you fight. Does that make any sense? You're gonna in two months become a great wrestler. Even a really seasoned wrestler is gonna have trouble taking O'Malley down. Now you, in a short period of time, isn't it better to spend those eight weeks? sharpening your best tools and making sure that you dominate the striking portion of the fight. <clears throat> Coach, you missed my Ramadan gift super chat. Did I? Thank you, Samuel. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Oh, what did I just do there? Oh, guys, also, we hit 300,000 subscribers. Congratulations to uh, this channel. Thank you guys for all the support that snuck up on me. I've, I haven't done a post in a while because I was deep in training camp. But I'm back to regular schedule now, and we hit 300,000 subscribers. Really happy about that. Thank you all for uh, being subscribers. I'm 19 and want to do amateur MMA. Any advice? Yes. Train for a year. Go to a good club. Train your ass off. Get Make sure you're able to spar. And if your sparring results are good, sign up for a fight. If not, don't sign up for a fight. ADHD is a gift or a curse? That's from Adventus. Depends. If you hyper-focus on something that can make you successful, it's definitely a blessing. I'll tell you something. I have ADHD. GSP has ADHD maximum. Maximum. Like, But me and him are so obsessed with like wrestling, jiu-jitsu, boxing. That, that actually works because we tune out everything else. We have a hyper-focus. Like there's nothing else in the world. Like you could set off a bomb on the other side. I'm not. I'm not even gonna hear it. I was focused right here, guys. I have my attention right here. Like um, there's nothing else in the world. Like it's just like there's nothing else. It can be a very good. Um, it could be a very a, a serious blessing. Because you know they say that like ADHD is attention deficit disorder, but you could also become mesmerized by one thing. So you don't pay attention. Like for me, like that's why like all my instructionals are straight to the point. Like I can't take like, uh, you know, like fluff. I, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And GSP is the same way, man. Like when I talk to him, I get straight to the point. Like sometimes we're, we're in a meeting with somebody or whatnot and the guy is trying to pitch something and he's going to go like he's going to give us a flowery speech, a deep background information, things that are irrelevant to this meeting. I'm like, I already, I already know this guy's not leaving here with the deal. Like I already know this guy. He's done. He's done. Like nobody's listening to him anymore. Like this, this, this is a wrong group of men to sit here with and talk like that. Like you got to get to the point. You know, I, I think it's really, really important to have, especially nowadays, because everybody's so bombarded by social media. Every everybody wants your attention. Everybody out there is trying to get you to click on their video, click on their message, like their post. Like you're getting your attention divided so much. Like I don't even like I try to avoid social media too much. You know, like I go very I go sparingly. Why? Because I have such a busy day. If I open my social media, I'm gonna get pulled into this. People are begging for attention. Like everybody's fighting for attention. It's like it's just it's a it's a frenzy. It's a fight for attention. And then you're like, you set this person in a little meeting. Okay, look, I'm gonna talk to you for 45 minutes. Let's have a meeting. And then he goes off on a tangent about how he got to this great idea. Dude, you should have started with the with the with the punchline. Nowadays, people want the punchline quick, fast, in a hurry. Why? Because I got these ten other things to click on. I got ten thousand other messages. You know, it's just it's insane amount of information being traded. You got to be quick nowadays. I think it's like a new way of 
a new world. Like, like if you're going to give me a message, if you're going to write a book, if you're going to, you got to give it to me in a, in a nutshell, man, straight and make me understand it. Like, don't give me like make one plus one equal to quick because I'm quickly going to lose attention. Why? There's 10,000 other people knocking on my door. It's an insane amount of uh, information being thrown our way. I mean, I was, listen, I, I, I was born before the internet. Like I saw this whole internet crazy insanity happen before my eyes. I think when I got internet, I was like 12 years old. It was like a weird thing. You know, you'd like, you'd like have to dial and then you hear these weird noises. And then you, okay, we're logged on. What, what's, what can you do on the internet? There was like a few websites. It was kind of nothing special. You could read the news on the internet. You could do all sorts of like little things. Nowadays, forget about it. Now on the internet, it's like, my, my listen, my Wi-Fi. Two weeks ago, my Wi-Fi went down for 24 hours. You should have seen my kids. My kids were like, no, they were devastated. They came home. There's no Wi-Fi. My children were devastated. Now, look, look, me too. I got to do business. I got to, I got to, you know, I got to communicate with people. Like, I got things to do. But my kids, man, my kids were freaking out. They're like, oh, we're going to grandpa's. We're going to go to Shido's house right now. Take us there. And I go, like, you're not going there. You have school tomorrow. You have training tonight. You have this and that. Schedule as usual. No. They're like, no, no. They, they're cut off from the world. You have to understand, my children have never lived at a time with internet. I try to tell them there was a time, you know, we didn't have internet when I was your age. They don't, they don't, they can't even fathom it. Like, what did you do? What did you watch? How did you entertain yourself? How did you talk to people? Like, uh, like they think the internet always existed. Like my kids grew up swiping. Like they all had iPads. Their generation, they grew up swiping. They never knew a world without swipe to unlock their iPad. Their window to the world. And, you know, I put them educational games and they, they, they don't, they, they don't understand. Like it's an insane amount of information they're exposed to far more than I was when I was a kid. And you got to sit there and you're going to talk to me. You got to go straight to the point. It's so, it's like today, it's so much worse than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, life was so much slower. <clears throat> how, how do you have energy all day long, coach? That's from water. That's a really, really good topic. Guys, energy, it's so important to have. If you don't have energy, life is very difficult to enjoy. Like, try to spend the day when you're tired. Like, I mean, let's say you have a really bad night's sleep. Like, let's say you have to work really late. Then you have to get up really early. Then, like, I, it happens to me when I travel. Like, sometimes we finish the fights late at night. Sometimes the, the fights, we're done with the fights at 3, 4 in the morning, especially when we fight on the East Coast. We get out of the cage at 12. After the interviews, after the finally settle down, we eat and all that. It's 3, 4 in the morning. My flight's at 6. Sometimes I got to be at the airport at 6. So I go through, like, and I land at home. I land maybe, let's say, I don't know, 12 p.m., 1 p.m. I'm I'm a wreck, man. I just, I came from the fights. I flew through the night. I barely slept. Sometimes I sleep 45 minutes, one hour. Like, it's a it's a rough Sunday, you know, even though, if, let's say we won the fight, I'm in a good mood. It's just a hard to live when you're fatigued, when you're not well rested. It's a very, very difficult thing. And there's a lot to know about having energy. There's a lot to know about having energy. It has a lot to do with how you eat, how you exercise. Not overdoing it. I think most people overdo it in the gym. That's why they can't keep up their schedule. And two, uh, excuse me, three, breathing. Belly breathing. Belly breathing is super ultra important. If you breathe, if you breathe in a shallow manner, if you breathe in a shallow manner, if you breathe through your chest, you're gonna, in my opinion, you're gonna have low energy. You're gonna have much lower energy than you would if you belly breathe. I'm actually quite uh, well versed in belly breathing. I remember one time I was doing a, a session with one of George's physio guys, and he was like, "Okay, I want to see you breathe." And I, I breathe, and he's like, I, "He's like, you're the first athlete I see actually belly breathe correctly. Belly breathing is so simple, yet highly, highly um, unknown. Belly breathing is so simple. I want you guys to visualize your stomach, okay? The the lowest part of your stomach. Just picture it as a balloon, okay? And just visualize the contour of your stomach. Visualize the contour of your stomach. Now, when you breathe, you got to feel the contour expand. And when you exhale, you got to feel the contour of your belly contract. You don't want the contour of your chest to elevate. 
That's where people, most people breathe in and out of their chest because when you're stressed, you breathe in and out of your chest. You ever notice that when you're stressed or scared or nervous, you start to breathe shallow in a shallow manner. You actually want to train yourself to do the opposite. Whenever you're stressed or emotional or, or frightened or whatnot, Whenever you're uncomfortable, you actually want to breathe through your nose and expand your belly. You want the contour of your stomach to expand. It's super simple. And then relax and expand and then contract and expand, but through the belly, not the chest. And you fall into this habit. Eventually, you're going to learn to calm your mind. If you calm your mind, excuse me, if you, if you belly breathe, belly breathing will calm the mind. If you slow down the breath, you will slow down the mind. Don't ever forget this. The, the breath is so important for controlling the mind. If you control the breath, you will also help control the mind. Thank you, 49. Very appreciated. Zakur al Khair, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Hello, Coach Zahabi. Hope you're well. I'm thinking about doing a degree in philosophy and wondering how was your experience studying this degree that's from jet jet i would highly recommend if you study philosophy have an end in mind okay have a goal in mind like for instance i wanted to become a lawyer so i was going to study philosophy and jump to being a lawyer okay now in philosophy you learn how to argue you learn how to think you learn how to analyze so it was a perfect springboard to becoming a lawyer however if you're not gonna i mean if you already have a career you already have because the thing is if you get a philosophy degree it's fantastic yes but it's a very intrinsic value it won't help you in, in, in your career per se. Like how you gonna how you gonna earn your life? How you gonna earn your money? Like when I was getting when I was getting my degree, a lot of people criticized me. Like, oh, what are you gonna do? Like, I'm like, man, I'm I'm not planning to be a lawyer. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit in the corner, beg for change, and philosophize about how broke I am. That was never my goal. But I would get a lot of criticism as soon as people heard, oh, you're doing philosophy. Oh, you're never gonna make money. You know, you're. They put an X on me. It's like, dude, relax. You know, like I'm not a dumb guy. You know, like I have a plan. All I'm saying is have a plan because philosophy can bring you down the rabbit hole. You can have very enlightening thoughts, etc. But at the end of the day, you got to pay your bills. You got to have you have house. You got to have your your life set up. That's why if you know, you always gotta you always gotta prep. As a man, you have to take care of your finances. It's a it's a it's a very important duty of a man has. So I would tell you. If you're secure in that sense, do it. If not, make sure it springboards to something that you can make money with in the future. It's very, very important because I know a lot of guys who study philosophy and yes, you know, they're interesting guys, but they never made any money in their life and they struggle for it and they suffer for it. They suffer. It's extremely important to be able to earn your uh, living. <laughs> Thank you, Tyrus. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Milos wants to know Rakic or Jiri opinion. I'm going to go with Jiri. I think he's going to have the edge in striking. I think he's going to be a little bit more athletic and then he's going to have the edge in striking. Hello, Coach Zahabi. My name is Quest. I had two super chats on your thoughts on the validity of the New Testament, especially Paul. That's from Quest. Quest, did you send a super chat? I didn't see it. No, we do have some super chats here. Ottawa sucks. What are fun things to do in Montreal? Is the Biodome worth checking out? Question mark. That's from Hassan. I don't think I've ever been to the Biodome, so I have no idea. Honestly, sorry to tell you, but uh, pass by TriStar Gym. That's a hot spot to check out. Please debate vegan gains on Israel. Would be great to hear a convo. That's from Adam Rogers. I don't think he's a subject matter expert per se, so I, I don't know why it would be interesting for us to chat. I think, I think scholars should chat about this topic, historians, but... Um, I, I, I dialogue with him a little bit via email, I should say. We corresponded and we decided not to have a conversation together. As a Jew, it breaks my heart to see so many Muslims, good hearted people, suffering and dying nonstop. All respect, Coach Ramadan Mubarak. That's from Samuel DeFranco. Samuel DeFranco, Zakalau Khair. I really appreciate this sentiment. It's a very uh, dear sentiment. 
Many people are suffering in the Middle East. October 7th was a horrific day, yes. There was a lot of atrocities. But what's going on now is horrible as well. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of people, innocent people suffering. And we can't forget, you know, we can't forget that this war didn't start on October 7th. This is a long, guys, my whole life I've been hearing about the Palestinian struggle. My whole life they want to fight for their freedom. October 7th was a symptom of nearly 100 years of oppression. Um, some people deny there was atrocities on October 7th. I'm not one of those, okay? There was definitely things that were haram. You know, Islam has rules of engagement, and they were definitely broken on October 7th. I did my research. There were some things that were reported that were not true. There wasn't 40 babies beheaded, even though it was on the lips of Biden. Guys, when October 7th happened, and I heard Biden say he saw 40 children beheaded, I came on this channel, I did a podcast, and I condemned it. I'm like, that's wrong. That's completely haram, 100%, without a doubt, haram. And they were saying all sorts of other things, which I can't repeat because I might get flagged on this channel. There was an exaggeration in certain ways. There was an exaggeration. There was propaganda, yes. That's why from now on, it was on the president's lips. I heard in my own ears. I'm like, okay, it has to be true. He said he saw a picture. I'm like, right away, man. I was like, no, that's that's unforgivable. That's unforgettable. Still, I don't condone collective punishment. I don't think that Israel should go and bomb innocent civilians. Not at all. It's not what I'm saying. Okay, absolutely not. I'm 100% against that. I think Israel is a, the biggest terrorist state today. They're worse than Hamas. Hamas is bad. Israel's, Israel's right-wing government, okay, not the people. The right-wing government, in my opinion, are worse than Hamas. And I say that openly. I have, no, I have no reservations. If you don't know the history of what this government's done, then you should do your research. I don't agree with Hamas. Now, don't forget, guys, don't ever forget this one thing. Netanyahu put Hamas in power. He called them an asset. He brags about putting them in power because he wanted to divide Palestine. He wanted to make Palestine an extreme. He wanted to give them an extreme government. Why? Because that way we'll never have a two-state solution. The whole world is telling Netanyahu, give us a two-state solution. He was negotiating with the PLO. The PLO was... A secular group. Palestine was represented by a secular group, the PLO. They wanted to accept the two state. It was Netanyahu who brags, he even brags about it. That Hamas, he put them in power, he funded them through Qatar, and they're an asset to us. Why? Because we can never make peace with Hamas. Hamas won't accept the two state. That was then. They re updated their charter. And no, it's there's so many, there's so much to know. I can't give a proper resume there's so much to know but october 7th there was a lot of haram things done a lot of wrong things done absolutely no doubt however these young men are also victims of torture of being born in a prison of having their water they're, they're drinking 80 percent of water in gaza is not drinkable they're being bombed on a regular basis they're having they're having their family members killed on a regular basis. They're having their children imprisoned. They're being, they have to go through checkpoints. They've never been outside these walls. They're living inside of, they live inside the world's biggest open prison. Open air prison. Obama said it best. Obama said their life is unbearable. He went to Gaza. He said, look, their life is unbearable. These young men, their life is unbearable. He actually said this, he said, if you met these young people, you'd want them to succeed. I've met, look, I have Palestinian family. I, I'll tell you something. All peoples around the world, none of them are born evil. None of them are born evil. That's the biggest myth. Oh, they're, they call them human animals. Okay, well, if they're human animals, then I'm a human animal. I carry the same genetic as them. Am I a human animal? No, I wasn't raised in poverty. I wasn't raised with bombs landing on my head. I wasn't raised with stories. Oh, my father was killed by this guy. Oh, my f uncle was murdered in this war. They took my f my great grandfather's home. They, you know, they burned their olive groves. They, I didn't grow up with stories like that. I didn't grow up being starved, tortured, imprisoned. I didn't grow up in a prison. I grew up in a loving, uh, peaceful environment. I'm a byproduct of that. The young men are for certain they're going to become radicalized. Would you blame the natives who were radicalized when they were colonized by the by the Europeans? When Europe came and colonized the natives, would you side with the Europeans? I wouldn't. 
when France came and colonized Haiti, they colonized the blacks and they enslaved them. Would you, would you, would you side with the colonials? I, I wouldn't. I would not. So I mean, there's a lot to say about this situation, but and it's so sad to hear so many Hollywood actors and stars side with Israel. And the reason there's one reason why they're siding with Israel because there are so many important people in Hollywood that are Jewish. And it's just a fact. I mean, they're they're openly Jewish, and they they're important people, and they have they're high, they're very powerful people. And Islamic world is not in Hollywood. The Islamic world, the brown people, the we're not at the top of Hollywood. We're not into it. That's not really our culture. But it has so much influence and power on who gets on the big screen and who has influence. And just on the Oscars now, recently, one of the one a Jewish man. He's all over the news. I haven't. I don't even know who he is. But he basically said, "Look, I'm not proud of what they're doing, and I'm a Jewish man, and I think I'm against it." And he was talking. He was openly um, asking for, you know, sympathy for the Gazan people. I thought that was very brave, incredibly brave. He was accepting a award of some sort, and he was saying, "Look, not in our name, basically. You know, not in those words, but he said basically, not in our name. I'm a Jewish man, but I don't accept this." I think every anybody who knows the story of 1948 would sympathize with the Palestinians. The Palestinians are a byproduct of their history. They've been murdered. They've been massacred. They've had their bank accounts seized. They've had their land seized. They've been corralled into a little corner. They've been blockaded. They've been bombed on a regular basis. They have their children. Imagine you send your child to school and you find out he was imprisoned. A seven-year-old child, a five-year-old child. They have hundreds of children imprisoned in Israel, Palestinian children face military court. 99% conviction rate. How is that possible? How is that? you? Anybody out there can answer me this. You're convicting children at a rate of 99.9%. .9%. That's insane. That's a complete insane number. That's an insane number. It's not possible. Imagine if the black communities in America were being convicted at 99% conviction rate would you call racism would you say hey, that's racism would you fight for your right it's an insane amount of torture it's been almost a hundred years it's an eyesore to the world like there are many eyesores in the world there are many I like, got a lot of people who write me what about this what about that you're right there are many and I sympathize with all of them okay I sympathize with all of them but this has been going on for almost 100 years like I can't wait I hope to see the day that Jews and Arabs live in peace I hope to see the day. And one state, look, if you're really a democracy, would they always try to say, oh, we're the, only, we're the only democracy in the Middle East. No, you're not. You're not a democracy. If you were a democracy, you give everybody a vote. It's a reverse democracy. The government chooses the people. The government said, hey, there's as many Arabs as there is Israelis. No, no, no. Let's get rid of the Arabs. Do what you have to do to get rid of them. Put them in this area. Shuttle them to the outside. We're going to let our people that we trust, we like, we choose the people. The government will choose the people and then the people will vote for us. That's what's really happening in the Middle East, in Israel. It's not the people who chose the government. No, 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 no. It's the government who chose the people. Don't ever forget this. This is 100% accurate. If they were really a democracy, they would let everybody have a vote. A vote. There's just as many Arabs as there are Israelis. There's just as many Israelis as there are Arabs. When I came to Canada... We immigrated here. We bought land. I came here poor. My parents rented an apartment. We worked day and night. We worked day and night. We bought a home. We struggled. We we built our life. We didn't steal land from nobody. We didn't put a point a gun in anybody's face. We didn't point a gun in anybody's face. We bought our land. We bought our homes. We paid our taxes. We became a we contributed to society and we got a vote. There was no need for killing, murdering, uh, uh, taking bank accounts whatsoever. It was a non-violent immigration. That's what Israel had to do after World War II. That's what the Jews had to do after World War II. Find a place where they can legally immigrate, buy land. The Palestinians would have been happy. Land prices would go up. Their own land, land prices go up. They would be happy. Why do you think we have immigration in Canada? Pff, it helps the economy. They put more into the system. The real crux of the matter is the massacres and the taking of the land, the stealing of the land. And this is colonialism. They come and they take your they take your resources, they take your home, they take your land. 
They take it from you. All colonial projects of the past have all been frowned upon throughout history. This one's going to be no different. 50 years from now, historians, when they're finally not scared anymore, they're going to come out and say, hey, that was a genocide. That was colonialism. They took their their natural resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mike Goodwin, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you. Coach, what's the best country today to raise a family? That question mark. That's from MMA guy. Guys, I've been all over the world, but Dubai, if I had to pick, I would go to Dubai. It's, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful places in the world. You really have everything. And, of course, you have so much MMA, jiu-jitsu and all that. And You know I love that, so that would be a phenomenal place. You can walk with your family. You don't have to worry. Like, you can have a $100 bill hanging out of your pocket. Nobody's going to steal from you. You can have a Lamborghini. Leave your keys in the car. Nobody's going to steal your car. Nobody's going to bully you. There's no crime, like, no visible crime. Like, I went all over. I couldn't believe how friendly and kind and peaceful and respect. Everybody has respect for everybody. Um, I felt like I had total freedom, total freedom. Like, I don't know if you want to, if you, if you feel the need to urinate publicly, don't go to Dubai. Like if you're, if you're looking for trouble, if you're one of those guys, Hey, I, you know, I like to express myself by spray painting, you know, I want to spray paint my ideas on a wall. Don't go to a country like Dubai. They'll punish you. Don't be, you're going to get your ass kicked. Personally, me as a human being, I don't feel the need to do stupid things like that. You know, I, I deem them to be stupid. So for me, I feel like I have total freedom because there's nothing I would want to say that I can't say. Now, if you want to go out and you want to say something landish, don't go to a country like that because you'll find trouble. And I respect Abu Dhabi because they do everything to keep the family unit protected. Like, it's all about family. Like, everything, everywhere you go, it's family friendly. Everywhere you go, there's no trouble. There's no fear. You're not going to get intimidated. Your wife can go from one place to another. She's not going to get harassed. There's not going to be any trouble. You're not going to be, like, bullied or whatnot. It's, it's a beautiful beautiful country like for me that's what i would choose now for those of you out there who like feel like oh, i'm being suffocated because i don't have the li i don't have the liberty to do this or that then maybe it's not the country for you but for me i feel totally at liberty totally there's nothing i would want to do there's nothing i would want to say that i wouldn't be able to say so for me it's a perfect fit if he's not a scholar you should destroy him, him, and you'd educate him, his fan base. He said he's very willing to have a convo, but you decided not to. Why not talk? That's from Adam Rogers. I'll be totally honest with you. This is what I told him exactly. Okay, because I'll, I'll give you, an, I'll give you a real, uh, real truth here. Okay, he put on. You know, I was first. I was happy to debate any vegan. Okay, so I, I said, look, anybody vegan want to have a debate? Let's have a discussion. And he reached out to me. I said, yes. And then I kind of looked at his channel and I saw he's like really a troll. You know, he's trolling. He's very aggressive. He's very insulting. That's not my style. Okay. I don't like that. I like to be academic. I like to have a gentlemanly conversation. I know a lot of people out there love trolling or they love like back and forth insults. Then they're going to cut a little bit of it to try to, for me, I find that to be embarrassing. It's, it's demeaning. It's not academic. It's not the way, like I, I graduated in university. You know, you don't talk like that in university. In university, it's a totally different culture. If you have a point, you make it, you articulate your point, you cite your source, you make a compelling argument. You don't like, I don't know, like you don't to troll. Like trolls don't don't make it far in university. Like if you troll in a paper, if you write an essay and your whole essay is trolling, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get an F. So I find it to be honestly like embarrassing to be talking to somebody like that. I just find it personally embarrassing. Okay, and also like he had a picture of him holding a knife to his throat. And then he sent me a whole psychological uh, evaluation that he's perfectly sane. Because I told him, look, man, look, I don't want to be on, on the internet with you because you have a knife, like, literally on your throat like this. Like, It's like, do I really want to mix my name? I, I run a family gym, you know? Like, I run a gym where I train people's kids and, you know, I have a family atmosphere. Do I really want to be on a video with a guy who has a knife to his throat? No, personally, I don't want to do that, so... I just find it to be embarrassing, immature. Now, I know a lot of people do that for clicks, and I get it because that, they live off the YouTube channel. I don't live off my YouTube channel, you understand? So these guys, they live off the YouTube channel. Say so they need clicks, they need drama, they need, they need to, to be like up front and center because 
That's how much they make, they make their money. I watched one of his videos and I found it to be so absurd. Like I can't even begin to explain to him how absurd it is. Like he was talking about Islam and it's like, he went on a troll channel to use that as evidence. It's like so absurd. Like imagine you're writing an essay. Imagine you're in university and you're going for your PhD in Islamic studies. If he made that presentation and he put it on paper, he would get an F. Like it's so absurd. The source he was using is not, it's not an academic source. It's not primary source material. It's just a troll. He was literally using a troll online to make a point about Islam. It was so pathetic, so retarded. It was so idiotic you can't present something as proof without checking the source who said this who is this guy is he a is he a credited expert now a lot of people so cite the source a lot of people say oh that's a that's an appeal to authority it's a fallacy people don't even understand guys i'm formally trained in logic okay i'm not trying to say i'm smarter than anybody but i'm formally trained in logic appeal to authority is not a fallacy unless you guarantee it's unless you guarantee the conclusion because of the authority. That's it. Then it's a fallacy. So for instance, if I tell you guys I have skin cancer, and you're like, how do you know that? My barber told me. You're like, well, who's your barber, man? What does he know about skin cancer? Go to a doctor. Okay, I go to the doctor. And I say, okay, I get the world's best cancer specialist, and he confirms that this is skin cancer. Then I tell you guys, look, my doctor says I have skin cancer. He's the number one skin cancer guy in the world. The number one guy. Is that... Is that is my conclusion false because I, I made an appeal to authority? I didn't figure out that I have skin cancer. I didn't go study 20 years what skin cancer is, become a skin cancer expert myself and diagnose myself. I didn't do that. I relied on the on the information of an expert, a subject matter expert. Does that make me right? Am I sure now that I have skin cancer? The answer is no. You're not sure, but you're more likely right because you sought the, the opinion of an expert. Now, if I got two, three, four, five experts independently diagnose me and they say yes this is indeed skin cancer now the probability of me being right is much greater much higher more certain so if i say look i have these five experts that agree that this is skin cancer it's not wrong to use that as an argument it's not wrong at all however they have to indeed be experts now if i said i went to five different barbers and five different barbers told me that this is skin cancer i'm citing people who are not subject matter experts it's irrelevant me citing a, a, a barber is irrelevant it's not it's not right it's not wrong it's completely irrelevant it's like saying nothing when you cite a subject matter expert it's only a fallacy if you guarantee the conclusion on the basis that you cited these experts because those five doctors can be wrong those five doctors can be possibly wrong for instance it used to be a fact that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Then we found out, no, it actually has a lot to do with atmospheric pressure. It's not just how hot the water is. It also has to do with atmospheric pressure. So it no longer became a fact that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It depends on the atmospheric pressure as well. But there was a time that you could have got consensus from all the subject matter experts in physics that water boils indeed at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we can come up with a hundred examples in science where the expert agreed the experts agreed on something and they turned out to be wrong. That's why you cannot appeal to authority and be certain. Now, it's more than just an educated guess when you appeal to authority, but when you appeal to a non authority, then you're just like a you're just a honestly sorry to tell you, you're an ignoramus. You're an ignoramus. If you present a, if you present something to the world as something true and your source is not a, is not academic you what can i tell you like you're you're like a barber diagnosing cancer like it's just it's so embarrassing if you hand in a paper like that in university you're going to fail automatically it's just like it's too low of a level to have a discussion on these things like would i talk to him about veganism yes what I talk to him about religion and Islam, no. Why? Because he's just going to troll. He doesn't understand like his sources are completely garbage. And it's just, I don't know. What can I say? It's more. I think he's a smart guy. I'm sure he is. He's just, he's just trolling because he wants likes. He wants clicks. He wants to get people watching his video. So he's got to get drama. He's got to get like a back and forth. He's got to do a Jerry Springer flavor type video. I get it. But that's just not me, you know, because me, like... 
<laughs> like if we're gonna talk words, let's fight also. Let's also fight. Let's meet man to man. You know, like I'm not gonna sit there. You know, don't forget I come from a world of fighting. I come from a world of fighting. For me, fighting with words is like it's kind of like I find it so dumb. Like if you guys want to fight, you know, because look at I'm not talking about vegan gains anymore. I'm talking about a lot of YouTube guys. A lot. They get on the mic and they talk so tough and they chat like. They act so tough. And it's like, dude, you're you're hiding behind your mic and your keyboard. That guy's a million miles away and you're talking to him like if he was in the room, you'd do something about it. You know, which obviously you wouldn't. Like the worst case of all is Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. I, sometimes I see his videos, man. He's so aggressive. He's like, it's like, dude, somebody slapped this guy already. This guy's egging it on. He's inciting violence left and right. He's telling the whole world, let's go to war. Let's fight each other. Let's fight each other. He's sitting behind, Andrew Tate said it best. He's like, man, you're, you're always arguing for other people's children to go to war and you're sitting there on your booster seat. I love how Andrew puts him down. You're sitting there on your booster seat, egging on the world to go to war and you won't even like give the smallest possibility that we can have a dialogue and have peace. But he doesn't have to do any fighting. I can guarantee you Ben Shapiro has never been in a fight. He's never been in a fight in his entire life. He's never had... He's never, he doesn't understand what fighting and war is. He's, his whole life is living behind the screen. He makes lots of money and he lives, he lives comfortably. He never has to have violence at his doorstep. For him, violence is something he sees on TV. He doesn't see it face to face. He's never tasted violence. That's a whole different world. You know, a lot of people tell me, oh, they want to become fighters. When it's fight day, man, they change their mind. Oh, they realize, oh my God, wait, I have to spar? I, have, I, have, I didn't think this was going to be real. Like I... In his mind, he thought it was a good idea. Now, today, we're lacing up the gloves. Oh, man, he's having second thoughts. You have an epiphany. A lot of people have no idea what being tough is. Because for me, I find them to be very, like, embarrassing. You're embarrassing yourself. Like, you're such a... That's not... I Look, I grew up with the toughest people in the world. Like, literally, the toughest human beings in the world. They break bones and they keep going. So for me to be enticed to talk to somebody with words across the screen, I find it to be pathetic. Like, I mean, it's like, I find it to be a joke, a total joke. Like, I find them to be such clowns. Like, if you're really, if you're really that angry, if you're really that committed to your cause, why don't you just get in the ring? Why don't you challenge the guy, man? Get in the ring with him. Ben Shapiro would never get in the ring with anybody. Never. Never. I'm telling you, he's so far from what something he would ever do. And you guys could tell me he's an intellectual, yes and that, but... My point is not that he's not an intellectual. He's an intelligent guy. My point is that he's talking about things he has no idea. He has no idea what it is to be on the front line, take a bullet in the leg. He has no idea what it is to have the courage to go and fight somebody. He has no idea. He's living in the world behind the screen. He sees numbers and statistics, and that's all it is to him. I think he would think twice. If it was his kids on the front line, if it was his children dying, if it was his family members dying, if it was his children dying, he would change his he would change his tune. That's what I think. That's my opinion. He'll debate in person, civilized. That's from certified bangers. Listen, if if people really want me to have a discussion with him, I will. And if it was in person, that would be great. But uh, and I wouldn't hit the guy. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be physical in any way unless he stepped out of line. Like it would have to be something extreme. I'm not saying I want to beat anybody up. All I'm saying is that people talk tough. Like they're gonna fight. And it's like guys, you're behind the screen. You're never gonna fight each other. Like don't get excited. You know. I just find that, that people are like, I find it to be embarrassing, man. Because the world I come from, yeah, we talk like that, but we're actually fighting. You know, there's a day. <laughs> there's a day. There's a place. We're gonna meet. We're gonna punch each other. So these words don't mean like they mean something. We're not just talking here. We're going to fight. But I feel it's like, imagine you saw these two guys at a press conference. They talked up a storm, how they're going to beat each other up, and both guys don't show up to the fight. It's like, <laughs> what was all that talk about, man? I'm not going to listen to you talk again the next day because I feel like, what a waste of my time. Like, this guy, I'm not, I'm not talking about vegan gains here. I'm just talking about, like, how much, how how many internet tough guys there are. It's insane. That's why, look, Alex, I, I respect Jake Paul because he talks tough and he gets in the ring. And I've said that after he beat Woodley. I came on this channel. I said, look, the guy's a real boxer. I respect him. He can fight. He went in there. Excuse me. He had the guts. He threw down with a guy who's a serious fighter. 
He came out on top twice. The guy's a serious boxer. I don't care if you like him or not. The guy can fight. And I respect that about him. And I'm not saying I don't like Jake Paul. I don't know anything about Jake Paul. I don't know the guy personally. But I can tell you, even if I didn't like him, if I knew him personally and I didn't like him, I'd still respect him. Look how important, look how huge that is. Like if Ben Shapiro got in the ring and actually fought his battles. Like if he actually went to war. I wouldn't say I like him. I don't like him, but I respect him. He has the guts because he's not just talking and sending other people to do the fighting. That's the worst guy. Because he's a fighting age. If he's talking and he actually steps in the ring and he actually fights and he's actually getting a taste of what's out there. I still don't agree with him. I still have a different point of view. Yes, but I respect the guy. I can respect people I don't like. But if you're going to talk tough and send other people to war and other people, you're going to incite violence to me, you're the biggest coward. You are the biggest coward. You're such a coward, man. It's incredible. Okay, one guy just got banned. Five financial advice for young men in their 20s. That's from TX. I will tell you guys, get into crypto. Like, I bought crypto long ago. I don't regret it. The bull market is happening right now. Like, if I can go back and tell my 20-year-old self what to do, and it was now this day and age, I will tell you guys, in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, crypto is going to be like a regular thing. Like, everybody knows about crypto in 20 years from now. Everybody's using crypto. Countries, countries are going to make it legal tender. I, guys, this is just my speculation. Don't take any financial advice. I'm telling you what I would tell myself if I was 20 years old right now in 2024 and at the future me was older and came back in this day and age to tell 20-year-old me. Nowadays, I would tell the 20-year-old coach, Sahabi, I'd say, do dollar cost average. Take 100 bucks a week and buy crypto with it. Don't even look at the price. The price is up. The price is down. Just spend $100 a week on crypto every day for the rest of your life. And then later on, you're going to have a ton of money. Crypto is going to explode. I like Bitcoin. I like Ethereum. I like Avalanche. I like Solana. Again, guys, these are my own personal picks. You guys do your own research. Do your own thing. Study your own crypto. You can lose money in crypto, of course. Two years ago, there was a crypto winter. That was my fourth crypto winter. Third or fourth. I can't even, I don't even count them. I have diamond hands, what they call in the crypto world, diamond hands. We buy and we never sell. We buy and we never sell. People don't understand it. And then in the future, we're going to borrow against our crypto. People always wonder, like, how are you going to buy your car with crypto? I'm not buying a car with crypto. One day, I'm going to, there's going to be a trustworthy company that will use my, it already exists, by the way. I just don't trust any of those companies. You can lend them your crypto, you can use your crypto as collateral and borrow money against your crypto. Then you can open a business, you can buy a house, whatever it is you want to do. You can buy properties, etc. That's the end game. People always ask me, what's the end game? Crypto is a long play. Take a hundred bucks a week, whatever you can afford a month, put it in crypto. Study study the crypto market. The crypto market, in my opinion, will outperform any other asset in the next 10, 20 years. By far, by far, by, by an incredible margin. And I will tell you, what I trust the most is Bitcoin, Ethereum, Avalanche, Solana. That's pretty much it. I think Metaverse might make a comeback. They're going to start talking Metaverse in a year or so. And I bought Sandbox. I'm not selling Sandbox. I'm keeping it. Why? Because I think the Metaverse talk came around. It it t it tanked. No worry. It's going to come right back around again. That's how these cycles happen. It's Bitcoin's going to explode. Then Ethereum. After that, it's going to be the altcoins. Altcoin season. They're going to explode. If you're lucky enough, if you're fortunate enough to land on a good altcoin, you can 1,000x, you can 500x your money. But that's very rare, very hard to predict. I think the biggest trap is trying to time the market. You think, oh, I'm going to buy it low and I'm going to sell it high. Dude, you never know when the market's going to go down or up. You never know. Just keep buying, buy, buy. You don't have to buy a ton. Now, if you're sitting on 100K in your bank account, I will tell you, like, take 50K and buy crypto right now. Then call dollar cost average. Don't look at the price. Bitcoin, in my opinion, guys, I know I'm going to say this and it's going to be crazy. I had Michael Saylor out on here. I think Bitcoin is going to be worth $1 million a coin in our lifetime. $1 million a coin. Call me crazy. I think it's going to reach 100K. Easy. Look, it just hit, reached another all-time high before the happening. 73,000. Let me check right now. Did it hit another all-time high? 
let me see right here. Hold on a second. Rank market cap. Descending order. 73,000. It's still at the all time high. Guys, and that's before the happening. I'm not going to explain what the happening is, but shortly there's going to be a supply squeeze. The price is easily, in my opinion, easily going to cruise over 100K. Easily. By the end of the year, it's going to be at 150, 170K. Double. Double what it is now. If you put $100, it's going to be $200 at the end of the year. What do you think it's going to be in five, six, seven years when you're investing? You've got to be thinking five years up. If you're 20, you're thinking 10, 30. Sorry, you're thinking 10, 20 years up. You want to retire up this stuff. If you were 20, my friends, do dollar cost average. Every week, put money in crypto. Don't look at it. Don't worry about the price. Find your favorite crypto project. In my opinion, make sure you hit Bitcoin, Ethereum. In my opinion, those are the most solid, most trustworthy, especially Bitcoin. Bitcoin might not 100x right away, but like the smaller coins. However, 20 years from now, we're still talking about Bitcoin. In my opinion, we're still talking about it. Get into crypto. Research crypto. It's far more, it has more potential than any other type of investment. Where to buy crypto coins in a safe way? That's from MMA guy. That's a good question. Okay. I like Coinbase in Canada. We use Coinbase. Um, I have, we have a dealer here in my, my city. We have a guy who has a, he has a crypto coin office. Like if you can find that also, go get to know them, talk to them. You know, how long they've been there? Are they trustworthy? Start with small amounts and build your way up to higher amounts, but don't give anybody all your money. You know, be careful. Always go with small amounts. But Coinbase is very trustworthy, especially for Canada. I trust her, but I don't keep my coins on a on the on an exchange. You know, you gotta you gotta do your research, guys. How to do cold storage. It's not something I can give you a, a breakdown on now, but you gotta get a ledger or a or a trezor and you gotta put your crypto in cold storage. When should someone confront or fight someone in the streets? If someone insults my girlfriend, when is it okay? Jotko says that if you should never fight in the streets and even run away. I'm confused. Honor versus self-preservation. That's from Mike. Mike, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Guys, look. If somebody insults my woman in pu public, I, I wish I could tell you I would walk away. I wish. I wish. I wish I was such a good person. But I guarantee you, I will take my wife, I'll put her in the car, I'll tell her to drive home, and I'll beat the shit, I'll beat the hell out of that guy. I'm telling you, that's the kind of person I am, and I hate to say it because I know that it's not good. But if somebody insulted my wife, I would break his. I hate to say it, okay, but I would lose. I, I'm the I'm that type of guy. I'm like really nice. I don't fight for no reason, but it, like if you insult my wife, that like I would lose it. If you insulted me, I'll probably like smile at you and leave. If I have my wife present, I'd, I'd get her in the car and then I'd probably come back and slap you or something. But I wouldn't fight in front of my wife. I'd try to avoid it because it's, it's happened before and she really doesn't like it. Like it's happened to me once. I had an altercation with somebody and she really was upset with me. She doesn't like violence. She's very anti-violence, et cetera, et cetera. She doesn't, she never grew up with violence. She never saw anything violent. Like she doesn't, you know, it's not her thing. And I get it. But if somebody insulted my wife, I got to tell you guys, I'm, I'm being honest here. I'm just being an open book. I would beat the shit out of the guy. I would just mess him up. I'm sorry to tell you, like, he he would he would learn a lesson that day. And uh, I wish I could tell you I'm a better person than that. I, I just, I know it's wrong, but I just, I couldn't control myself. I just can't control myself. I feel like if that guy's doing that to me, this is my logic, okay? If he's doing that to me, he's going to do it to someone else. If I straighten him up, he's going to be a better person. That's, I, know, I, I'm, I know you guys might think I'm sick to think like that. Maybe I am, but I know that, like, I'm going to go back there. I'll slap the guy. And if he makes a move, I'll crush him. And if he doesn't make a move, he's going to learn not to mess with guys, not not to mess with people. And he's going to be a better person. Next time he's in a public place, he'll be like, you know what? People are here dining or they're, you know, having a good time. Why should I insult them? Why should I insult them? Why? And he's going to think. He's going to double think. And um, I think he'll be a better person for it. So that's just my opinion. Now, run away? No, I would never run away. Never, never. Jocko, my opinion is wrong. Why? You're going to die inside, guys. You're going to die inside. Your wife's going to look at you. She'll be like, you're, you're, she be like, this guy, man, he's a coward. He's a coward, man. Like, there are things worse than death. Okay. There are things that are worse than death. 
Like, why are you running away for? You scared? Like, <sighs> I think I would die inside. Like, I wouldn't run away. No, I would not. <clears throat> Look, I avoid street fights. Like, if I was walking with my wife in the dark street and there's like five guys walking behind me, I'd cut the corner. I tried. Like, I get it. There's five of them. They can kill us. You know, like, I get it. I'm not crazy. However, I, look, as long as I get my wife to safety, I'll fight to the end. That's just the, the attitude I have. You know, it's just the attitude I have. And I, and I don't think it's wrong per se if it's self-defense. You're self-defending. Your self-defense is good. I would personally, if I saw a man, if I saw a man and his wife and his kids or whatever, I wouldn't, even if I didn't like the guy, I wouldn't bother him at all. I wouldn't even look in his direction. He has his wife and his kids. There's something sacred. And like, you got to respect the boundaries. Like, the man's here with his family. You know, you can't, you can't have an altercation with them. You know, it's like, is there anything sacred in society? For me, it's family. It's super important, man. If I see people with their, if I see a family in any any public area, I'm going to make sure that we don't disturb them. For me, I, find, I have a high respect for family. You know, it's super important. But unfortunately, some societies don't, and I find it to be problematic. And I think, I think old school guys should straighten them up. Should straighten up. You should respect family. You should respect people, the elderly, you know. That's why I like, you know, Sometimes when fighters do stupid things and they disrespect the elderly, disrespect women, they disrespect children. For me, that's not, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a fan no more. You know that, that draws the line. I don't care how many championships you have. If you punch an old guy in a bar, for me, there's an X on you. You know, like it's really, really bad. You can make amends, you can make things right, yes, but then you gotta be really on the straight and narrow for good because you drew the, you you crossed the line. You gotta be on the straight and narrow for good after that. If you're not, for me, it's. Spicy gets clicks. That's from Shepard. That's very true. Spicy headlines, drama. I get it, you know, but it's just like, it's not for me. You know, I'm not that desperate for money. I don't need money that badly that I'm going to start doing click. You know, I'm not going to start like, I'm not going to turn this channel to the Jerry Springer. And I'm sure you guys would love it. I'm sure the ratings would skyrocket. <laughs> but listen, we can't all be Jerry Springer. You know, we got to have some something in the world that's like, you know, stable, you know. How would you go about fighting a man like Brad Martin? Who's Brad Martin? What do you mean Brad Martin? Hold on. Brad Martin. Brad Martin. Brad Martin was born. Oh, he's a jacked, super jacked YouTuber. Let me see here. Brad Martin. Is he like super muscular? Hold on a second. Brad Martin. Brad Martin. Picking up girls' culture. Leg Day Live. Okay, so he's just like a super bodybuilder. Is that it? I can't even get a picture of him. Dude, honestly, I'll just, I'll just use boxing. Like, if I was fighting a big bodybuilder like that, I would just use boxing. Because, you know, their shoulders are so big. How's he going to swing his arms? Like, I would just get in between his arms. I counter punch him. Like, I just... I'd hit him on the chin. Like, it wouldn't bother me at all. Like, because they're so big and so bulky. Like, when they punch, it's like really, like, you know, I would just kind of circle around them, head movement, throw some hands. And I don't see if I don't need us. I don't think we need a special strategy. Now, if he grabs onto me, you got to know what you're doing because he's very big and strong. He could pick you up and slam you. You got to know what you're doing. You got to, you know, but I don't think he's trained in martial arts. So it shouldn't be a problem. Do you feel like people today are becoming more dumb due to being chronically online? That's from Hassan. I don't think they're becoming more dumb. I think people are acting dumb to entertain one another. And dumb, I use it in loose, you know, like they're being goofy. They act a certain way to get attention because it's funny for some reason, you know, like jackass, you know, like they're, they're doing like crazy stunts to get attention. It's becoming an attention and because people, people are more informed than ever. Like if you say something, if you're at a dinner table, you're like, Oh no, this and this. People are gonna like pick up their phone. Hold on, let me fact check you right now. Like you know, they ha people have the internet access at reach all the time. They're more informed than ever. Why they act like that on the internet? It's just for likes, fun. You know, they're goofing off. They're being human. Coach, what are your thoughts on karate combat? That's from Harrington. I love it. I love karate combat. I hope to get involved in karate combat. I think it's great. Three three minute rounds. I saw a Bitboy fight. <laughs> One cryptocurrency guy fight another Bitboy. 
Uh, I followed BitBoy for quite a while, you know, because not that his picks are great, guys. I wouldn't take his picks, guys. I, warning, warning, warning. Do not take BitBoy's picks, okay? He's 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 pushing stuff, but he was very informative. Like if something happened in the crypto world, he would tell you about it in a very clear and concise way, and he'd get straight to the punch. So if somebody sold or if somebody bought or if there was a move in the market, he's great for that. However, I think he's had a problem with drug abuse or whatnot. But before before his drug abuse days, you know, he was really good for getting information. He had a great show. He was uh, really good at communication. However, I wouldn't trust his picks. Whatever he tells you, a cryptocurrency is good. Don't believe him, okay? You shouldn't believe anybody. You should do your own research because uh, BitBoy is just pumping. He's just trying to pump, pump coins and he's trying to make his money somehow, some way. Like he's a money guy. But there was a time where he had a great show called BitBoy and he would give you the news of what's going on. What's going on in crypto today? <clears throat> Which cryptos are trash? That's from Patty Cake. Ninety nine percent of them are trash. Ninety nine percent. I I would never personally. I would never buy a meme coin. People buy meme coins. I know people make a lot of money with meme coins, but meme coins is just like. People behind a computer screen trying to pile money up together and they're playing chicken with their money. Okay, let's raise money. The money's going up. The coin's going up. Who's going to rug pull first? Who's going to sell? Who's going to dump? So they get together behind a meme coin. It's funny. They share it. They put it on social media. People start bu buying. Everybody puts 100 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever. The coin starts to rise in value. And then if, shh, all of a sudden, you never know when they're going to pull the rug out from under you. People are going to dump. It's just like a game of chicken with money on, on the computer screens. It's not it's not something that's going to be adopted, in my opinion, in long term. Like some meme coins could, and that will be a legit. Because at the end of the day, a coin is only, crypto is only legit if it gets a, adoption. Everything is a scam unless it gets adoption. Don't ever forget that, okay? Metcalf's law is true. The more people use it, the more valuable it is. The more people adopt it, the more valuable it is. I think Bitcoin now is mainstream. Everybody knows the word Bitcoin. In the biggest institutions in the world are getting into it. It's going to hit. There's there's no, there's no, almost, there is very little doubt that it doesn't hit 150K. That's double your money. Now, you tell me where you could put $100 and double it. You're going to go to a casino? You're going to roll? Like, what are you going to do? Like, I'm telling you, I'm so confident that this year, Bitcoin is going to reach 150000 From now to a year from now, okay? It's going to be 150000 So that means if I, if I have $500 in my bank account, if I bought crypto with it, next year it'll be at 1000 And I'm like I, highly certain of this. Highly. So if I had, had 50000 why don't I just throw a whole fifty in there? It's going to make a hundred k. Like if I'm not using that money, let me double it. Now, I know it sounds crazy. It's super aggressive. But that's why I tell you guys, do your own research. Look into crypto. Crypto is doing incredible things like the internet did. And in the future, everybody's going to know about it. It's going to be too late. Everybody's going to throw their money in. It's not going to 10x no more. It's not going to 2x no more. It's going to keep increasing in value forever, possibly, because it's deflationary. Even though there are some problems with those those ideas, you know, you can make Bitcoin inflationary if you keep forking it. That's like a more advanced topic for another day. Cryptocurrency ultimately is supposed to be deflationary, which I think ultimately it is, but there's debate about that. It's going to keep increasing in value over time, just kind of like gold because it's rare and, you know, miners can still gold. They can still mine about 2% gold a year. So about 2% new gold is found and put into the market. So that dilutes the value. Crypto, if you're 20, 20 years old, if you're 20 years old today, when you're 40 and you're still holding the crypto you bought when you were in your 20s and your 30s, you're going to be retired. In my opinion, it's going to have matured. It's going to have saturated by then. But right now, the market is super young. You can't put your money in the stock market and double it in a year. You can't. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't exist. The highest it's ever gone in a year, I think, was like 40%. That was during COVID. 40%. That was the biggest. 40%. You could do that in six months in a crypto. That's how powerful crypto is. It's insane.
Coach, how many wives do you have? <laughs> That's from Rainbow. Rainbow, I wish I could tell you, but I don't have the freedom here because you know people here they're so uh, restrictive. They don't have the they don't have the they don't have the freedom like we have in other places in the world where we have free, we could talk about these things openly. But in this country, you can't talk about these things. No, no, no. It's taboo. It's bad. They have LGBTQ, but they won't have P for polygamy. They can have you can have polyamory, but you can't have P for polygamy. No, no. P is where they draw the line. No, all they give you every letter. They give you every letter in the rainbow, but don't give them the P. No, 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 no. A man and two, three, four women happily married together, all consenting. No, 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 no. That's barbaric. That's preposterous. That's illegal. That's wrong. That's forbidden. But five people who want to be married. Five people who want to be in a relationship. They go, oh, that's fine. That's fine. As long as it's not. As long as it's not committed. As long as you don't have paperwork to go along with it. That's perfectly fine. Oh, sure. Every other way is... Per like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just... I, w I would love a logical explanation. Why they draw the line on polygamy? Why? Why there? Why? Wh what was the <laughs> What was the logical distinctive? Like, what made you distinguish? Okay, this is right. This is wrong. This is legal. This is illegal. Man, I would love to hear that argument. Coach, what do you think about Cedric Dumbe? Is he legit? That's from Jake. Yes, absolutely. He's one of the greatest kickboxers ever. He's absolutely legit. Recently had a fight. Uh, he got disqualified in a fight because he had like a, he had something stuck in his foot. He had a piece of glass or something. I don't know what it was, but he kind of waved to the ref and the ref was like, you know, you got to keep fighting. He's like, man, I got something in my foot. I just stepped on something. Ref called it off and he was freaking out, but he's a legitimate fighter. He's a glory champion. He's a, he won one, uh, fight in Bellator, I believe it was like a few second KO. Was it in Bellator? I can't remember. The guy's a heavy-handed kickboxing extraordinaire, like kickboxer extraordinaire. Keep an eye on him. I think he's gonna do great things in MMA. Coach, you are too full of pride. Islam teaches against this. That's from Alex. I assume it's because somebody insulted my wife and I beat him up. You think that's pride? I don't really think that's, I don't know, like, I, I can't tell you it's pride or not. I just find, like, look, it's wrong. It would be wrong for me to beat up a guy for that. Like if you go to a, if you go to a, an imam or a sheikh, he's going to tell you, look, don't beat the guy up because he cussed your wife. Just leave, you know, be peaceful. I'm just telling you, I'm not good with that. I, I, I agree it's wrong what I'm doing. I agree. And maybe it is pride. It's just like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just want to straighten the guy out. You know what I mean? Because I feel like if I leave, he's going to, He's gonna treat people like shit, you know. He's gonna he's gonna be a he's gonna be an evil person in society, and I feel that with all of my years of training, I could fix that one guy. I could straighten him out. I mean, you can call that pride. I just feel like I don't know. It doesn't sit easy with me, and I agree, it's wrong. Beat, be, to beat people up over words is wrong. I get it. I just I can't help myself. I have a I have a disease. Coach, what's your opinion on sweeps, dumps, trips, and Muay Thai compared to say judo? Are they functional for MMA, BJJ, etc.? That's from Mars. Mars, I agree, they are functional. However, judo has far greater trips. And in in Muay Thai, you cannot hip throw somebody. Okay, there's you're limited to certain trips, so certain takedowns. I should say you're limited. So because judo is not limited, if you combine Muay Thai with judo, you'd have a crazy way of taking people down. I mean, it's incredible. Now, Muay Thai is better for kneeing into trips or tripping into knees. Like you could trip a guy and then knee him on the way down. They have a lot of good combos like that. Very dangerous stuff. So they both ha they both bring a lot to the table. However, if you had a wrestler, excuse me, if you had a judo, judo, a judo cut and a Thai guy clinching, the judo is going to take him down every time. 100%. Yes, sir, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you. What's your opinion on stoicism? I have discovered it a year ago and the positive effect it had on my life is incredible. Which philosopher should I study from here in your opinion? That's from Ket Timut. Ket, I'll tell you, look, I've only ever studied from the from the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius. Now you have uh, Seneca and you have another Stoic philosopher. The three make up Stoic philosophy. I'm forgetting the, the other philosopher's name. I've only ever studied Marcus Aurelius. Now I like stoicism but for me it's more psychology than pure logic so that's why i'm not too heavy to stoicism even though i have delved quite deeply into the works of marcus aurelius
Hey coach, I'm becoming I'm coming to Montreal in April and I'm thinking of taking a BJJ class, total beginner. What should I do to prepare? That's from Theleda. Theleda, I would tell you, go to jujiclub.com, use level up 50 off, use the promo code, get speed drills one and speed drills two. In the basic class, we have in TriStar, we have six days a week basic class. What do they do? They do speed drills one, which is speed drills from your back, and then speed drills two, which is passing speed drills super important video if you watch it that's what you're going to learn in class so you're going to have like a cheat cheat okay and i would recommend if you're very serious in jiu-jitsu by volume one two and three those three volumes are super important because this is basics close guard then basic passing guard and then ashigarami ashigarami if you get past volume three man you're really you're really ready to do anything like you can roll in any gym in the world um, I put those in a specific order. Now, the speed drills are simpler. So I would start there. Speed drills, volume one. Speed drills, volume two. It's super simple. It's made to be simple. And you develop speed. You can do it for reps. So if you just watch it, when you go to class, you can have a greater understanding of what's going on in class. For us, you really worked over Shane Faison in sparring. He looked traumatized. I never knew your boxing was so good. Do you think... You surprised Shane? Question mark. That's from Mike Goodwin. Um, did I surprise him? I think he he knows. I know I'm I'm, I'm very well versed in boxing. You know he's a very he's a very well seasoned guy. He does a lot of martial arts, deep in martial arts. But of course, you know I'm training at a professional level. I'm training like twice a day with professionals all day long. So it's like a different level of intensity. You know, he's uh, very skilled himself. He's very very well schooled himself. He does a lot of you know training with a lot of. Uh, elite personalities he's very serious about training but he's not in fight camp like i am i'm in fight camp after another one after another sometimes i'm in four or five fight camps at once like we got four or five guys fighting at once not uncommon so imagine how many hours we're talking about fighting how much we're going over it how much we're drilling it's just an insane amount of martial arts so it's just really another level of of intensity Thoughts on mob war happening in Montreal saw on the news. That's from Adam Rogers. Adam Rogers, I only have one thing to say. No comment. Okay, that's way too close to home. What are John Denar's requirements for giving someone a black belt? That's from Oasis Ops. That's a better question asked to him, but I'll tell you something. He's very strict. He's very tough. I think I was his seventh black belt. He was teaching in New York for years, like 15 years. I don't know how long he's been teaching when I was training with him. And he's, I was his seventh black belt. Like, think about that. That's insane. That's an insane. He's very strict on giving belts. He's very, very strict. Like, he wants you to know position after position, detail after detail. Like, he's giving you a PhD. John is like, like, I'm strict, but I'm not as strict as him. He is crazy strict. Like, John is like another level strict. Like, you got to be like, you got to be incredible to get a black belt for him. It's really like, John is the most, John is the most strict instructor I've ever seen like in terms of giving belts, like the most. Like you could be a purple belt and win, beat five black belts, and he's not gonna give, he's not gonna promote you. It's not good enough. Those black belts were not good. You got you got like these, but like no, those guys got on the podium. No, he doesn't want to hear it. It's, it's, those guys weren't good. You you're not ready for brown. It's, he's very 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 strict. <laughs> it's crazy. I love him though. I love him for it. He's like an old school Japanese thinking type martial. Like it has to be perfect. He's incredible. What an incredible human being. Guys, you have to understand how much this man has dedicated his life to jiu-jitsu. He has no wife, no kids, no hobbies. His ho he doesn't golf. He doesn't like uh, bake. He doesn't like, uh, you know, what, if, what do normal people, human beings do? Watch TV? What? He doesn't have a TV. He doesn't own TV. Like his whole life, he wakes up in the morning. He gives four practices a day. Think about it. He's teaching four classes a day. His whole day, his whole life, everything is jujitsu. We're talking about seven days a week. There's no time for podcasting and this and no, 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 no. Like this doesn't do anything like that. There's no extracurricular activity. It's very rare he kicks back and does anything else. You know, it's very rare. Okay, guys, we're going to have to uh, end this shortly. So please give me your best questions. We're going to sign off very shortly. How would you fix Tony Ferguson? Okay, guys, that's a great 
That's a great question. Please, no more super chats. No more. This is the last one. Okay, this is the last one. Guys, if I was working with Tony Ferguson, I would take him back to the basics. Like whenever you, you, you're you lost, whenever you're not sure, and this is true for anything, whenever you feel confused, I always tell my fighters this, always, if, I, if you're ever in a fight and you're not sure what to do, you're confused. Go back to the basics. Why? Because the basics... Listen, if you're trained well, you know your basics. If a fighter or anything in life, I don't care if you're an engineer, I don't care if you're a philosopher, I don't care if you're a mathematician, I don't care if you're a your pizza delivery guy. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a stock market guy or whatever. There are basics to whatever science you, you applied your, your time to. There are basics to your science. Whenever you're confused, whenever you're not sure, whenever the market puzzles you, whenever your situation, you're in a puzzling situation, Go back to the basics, do it perfectly like we're trained to do, and then start going to the next level, the next level, and figure out your problem again. Start all over again. Start with fresh eyes. Start all over again. Like I tell my fighters, the basics of a fight is hands up, chin down, footwork. If I'm confused, if I got hit with something, I'm not sure what it was. If I'm in a tight situation, I'm going to put my chin down, I'm going to put my hands up. I'm not sure what's going on in the fight. I might be discombobulated. That's fine. I'm going to move my feet. That's the smartest thing you can do. The worst thing you could do is just fight back harder than ever. So you're like, you don't realize it, but you're like, you're drunk. You know, you're drunk with, you're discombobulated. You think you're punching, you think you're punching perfect, but you're really punching. Like, you don't realize it. So like everything has, every art has a basics to it. If you go back to the basics and you build from, there's a reason why the, those are the basics. There's a reason why the basics are so important because that's really the heart of it all. You got to go back to the heart of it all. You lost your way somehow, somehow, some way, somehow. You lost your way. You got to go back to the basics. And then sometimes we need more than the basics to win. We do. But we start back from the basics. We re, we face that puzzle one more time. We try to answer it again with our more advanced techniques, but we select our options carefully. But it all has to start with the basics. That's the most important thing. It's hard to express. But if you've done something for so many years at a high level, and you've thought about it, you start to realize how important basics are. You got to go back to the beginning. And that's what I would do with Tony Ferguson. Like I saw his last fight. Okay, he didn't have a good performance. He didn't have a great performance. He worked with the, the a YouTube guy who's a motivator. I'm forgetting his name right now. He's super popular. Forgive me, I don't follow his work too much, but I know he's like super popular, super fit guy. And they did a lot of physical fitness and physical fitness is great. But all that motivation, all that talk, all that physical fitness, I saw like videos of him like doing like crazy workouts super early in the morning or whatever it was, just torturing himself. What did it amount to? Nothing. It didn't improve him at all. He lost his fight. I'm even forgetting who he fought. I can't even remember who he fought. Hold on, let me look that up. Guys, working hard, trying hard, pain doesn't equal success. Punishing yourself doesn't necessarily equal success, okay? Who did he fight last? He fought, oh, Patty Pimblett. Yeah, he lost, you know, you know. Look, he's had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven losses in a row. Tony Ferguson now has seven losses in a row. Man, there was a time he had like a 15-fight win streak in UFC. Something ridiculous, 14-fight win streak. Something ridiculous, like a ridiculous win streak. And now he's on a seven-fight losing, six, what did I say, six-fight losing streak? that I say it was hold on oh man seven fight losing streak his last win was Donald Cerrone and that was in 2019 that was an eye injury doctor stoppage so I don't know if we should even count that one the time after that he beat Anthony Pettis wasn't his best fight okay it was a tough fight before that he beat Kevin Lee in an interim title after that he went down on a slide man seven losses in a row he went back to the gym Again, guys, I didn't see all his training. I'm sure he did a lots of other training, but I would have went back to the basics of martial arts. Double leg, sprawl, underhook, wizard, front headlock, the basics. I would have sharpened up his basics again. Jabbing, probably. I would have tried to fix his jab, his cross, his back elbow, his kicks. Like, I would have went back to the basics. Something is... Think about when you, when you build a building. The first block, the basic block, has to be the strongest. If the basic block is a marshmallow and then you put something heavier on top, the whole thing's going to collapse. I don't care how you build it. It's all going to collapse. Once the wind blows, once somebody nudges it, it's all going to collapse. The first brick that you lay 
has to be the hardest, strongest, stiffest brick that can carry the weight of all the other bricks on top. The basics is so important. People forget the basics. If you want to learn how to invest, don't go to some secret guru, secret is going to whisper in your ear. No. Go to learn who's teaching the basics the best ever. Who's teaching the basics the most clear, concise, and proper way. That's what I want to learn. I want to learn the basics of it. And then from there, I'm going to climb up. Don't believe anybody who tells you, hey, you know those guys, it took 10 years to learn jujitsu and all that. I can whisper something in your ear. If you give me 500 bucks, I'll whisper it in your ear and you'll be a black belt overnight. Now, there could be tomorrow somebody who finds a better way to get good at jujitsu, mark uh, business, uh, architecture, whatever it may be. Yes, there, there's there is always that possibility. But if the guy wants you to pay him up front and then he gives you the secret, no, 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 no. Unless he has a string of success stories, I don't believe him. Because there's a lot of people out there trying to sell a secret formula to make a quick buck. The truth of the matter is you have to master the basics and build, 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 build to the higher level, the higher, more niche niche maneuvers, niche exercises, niche concepts. And then you're truly a master. You know, you've reached every level. But however, a guy like Tony, I think he's forgetting how to sprawl, how to underhook, how to snap down, how to whizzer, how to throw a basic jab. Like he's getting too much into these chaotic exchanges. He's forgetting the basic, the basics. Like when he was underneath Pimblet, he just the basic get-ups. He wasn't doing even the basic. He was kind of like trying to make too much out of nothing. He had to really, in my opinion, go back to basics of combat. Now, fitness is great, but it wasn't going to solve this problem. All the fitness in the world, all the pain in the world, all the treadmilling and lunges and bench pressing and and kettlebell, all that, it wasn't going to solve this problem. Okay, guys, with that said, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I do, and I hope to see you all again in the next episode. Thank you.